It happens. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Fred Farias, and I'm the chair of the coordinating board. It is right now 9.02 a.m., and I would like to call the October 21st quarterly board meeting to order. Please be aware that this meeting is being broadcast via the Internet, and those present in the boardroom may be visible to the public. Before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome those joining us via the video and ask that you observe the following etiquette. Please state your name before you speak, mute your microphone when not speaking, and keep background noise to a minimum, please. Members, when I call your name, please announce if you're present. I, Fred Farias, present. Donna Williams? Present. Ricky Raven? Richard Clemmer? Present. Robert Gott? Present. Emma Schwartz? Here. Sam Torn? Welcome Wilson. Present. Matthew Smith. Please record in the minutes that we have a quorum. Please excuse the absence of Javed Anwar due to the duties requiring his attention elsewhere. Do I have a motion to prove his absence? So moved. Motion by Ms. Williams. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Gaunt. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? None heard. The motion passes. Thank you. Next, I have the pleasure of introducing our new board members. The first item on our agenda today is the introduction of Richard Clemmer and Robert Gaunt. Richard L. Clemmer of Austin was appointed to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board by Governor Greg Abbott in September of 2021 for a term to expire in August 2023. Richard Clemmer is a global technology CEO, most recently leading the turnaround of NXP Semiconductors as Chief Executive Officer and President a position he held from 2009 to May of 2020. He continues to serve NXP as chairman and NXP NA as a strategic advisor. Prior to NXP, he was a senior advisor to Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts & Company, a private equity firm. He has also served as president and chief executive officer of Agri Systems Incorporated, an integrated circuits component company. Prior to joining that systems, Mr. Clemmer held a number of executive leadership positions at Texas Instruments Incorporated and Quantum Corporation. Mr. Clemmer currently serves on the boards of Aptiv PLC, HP Incorporated, Privacy co-founder and executive chairman, and Axon Networks, founder and executive chairman. Mr. Clemmer previously served on boards of NXP Semiconductors and NCR Corporation. He is also co-chairman of FIRST, the Robotics STEM Educational Nonprofit Activity, and serves in the advisory board of the Texas Tech University Whitaker School of Engineering. Mr. Clemmer holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Texas Tech University and a master's of business administration from Southern Methodist University. Welcome to the board, Rick, and would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much. I'm uh, truly looking forward to being able to participate with the board. I can't think of a more worthy cause than higher education in the state of Texas and how we prepare the workforce for the future and the evolution that's taking place in the state. Thank you very much, and congratulations on your appointment to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Robert P. Gaunt of Austin was appointed to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board by Governor Greg Abbott in September of 2021 for a term to expire in August of 2027. Mr. Gaunt is founding partner of Capital Creek Partners, a Texas-based multifamily investment firm. Mr. Gaunt previously served as founding partner of Avalon Advisors, building the firm's alternative platform with a focus on private equity, real estate, and hedge funds. Prior to founding Avalon Advisors, Mr. Gaunt held a variety of wealth management roles at Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, and Payne Weber. Mr. Gaunt is also co-founder of Capstar Ventures in Austin, an early-stage venture capital firm investing in consumer brands. Mr. Gaunt is currently a trustee for the University of Texas, Texas A&M Investment Management Company, UTEMCO, sitting on the Compensation Committee, Risk Committee, and Cyber Committee. He also sits on the boards of Contemporary Austin, RBI Austin, and Hope Mozambique. Mr. Gaunt was previously a trustee for the Teacher Retirement System of Texas, TRS, from 2008 through 2011, serving as chair for the Risk Management Committee and Investment Management Committee. Mr. Gaunt received a Master of Business Administration 
a Bachelor of Business Administration from the University of Texas at Austin. He currently lives in Austin with his wife, Kristen. Together with, they have three sons, Travis, Tyler, and Turner. Welcome to the board, Robert. Would you like to say a few words, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, I'm very, very humbled, very honored to serve in this capacity, and, and uh, the, it is an incredibly important initiative, educating uh, our citizens, and, and, um, and I, I'm honored to be here, and the passion that I've already experienced of the work that's taking place is refreshing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Robert, and congratulations on your appointment to the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. We look forward to working with you as well. Uh, the next item of the agenda is committee appointments. Effective September 22nd of 2021, I made the following appointments. Richard Clemmer as a member of the Committee on Academic and Workforce Success, and Robert Gaunt as a member of the Agency Operations Committee. A complete list of committee members can be found in the meeting materials. Before we move on, I would like to remind everyone that the annual Texas Higher Education Leadership Conference will be held at the AT&T Hotel and Conference Center in Austin on December 2nd and 3rd. After transitioning to a virtual event in 2020, the Coordinating Board looks forward to hosting its annual Texas Higher Education Leadership Conference in person. The 2021 Leadership Conference will include full in-person programming with appropriate COVID-19 protocols. This year's agenda will include training that fulfills the statutory requirements for university and college board members and trustees, an insider look at the refreshed statewide higher education strategic plan, discussions on budgeting, monitoring, and oversight of institutions of higher education, gear-funded initiatives, the impact of COVID-19 on institutions, and legislative updates. The 2021 State of Higher Education addressed by Commissioner Harrison Keller, and of course, a showcase of Star Award winners. Online registration is available on the Coordinating Board website now. So we encourage everyone uh, that's, that's interested to please attend. It's always a great event. It's the highlight of the year, and we look forward to letting the state and all the stakeholders know about the great work that's being done in Texas higher education. Fellow board members, staff request that you confirm your attendance at the conference by completing the form provided in your meeting materials today. Staff will collect the completed forms at the end of this meeting. Our next agenda item is 1C, Commissioner's Remarks. The Commissioner will provide his remarks of some of the agenda items that we will be discussing today. Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, board members and uh, those of you who are in the audience. It's good to see some audience here in person and uh, also good morning to those of you who are uh, watching uh, today's meeting online. Um, so I want to join Chairman Frias and the rest of the board in welcoming our two new board members. Uh, we're grateful to have you in this important role. We look forward to working with you. Um, I would also uh, like to express my deep appreciation uh, to Ricky Raven uh, for his service on the board. Ricky uh, can't be with us this morning, um, but, uh, but uh, he's been a terrific board member and a great partner on a number of uh, our initiatives and uh, really appreciate uh, Ricky's partnership. And as, uh, so as Dr. Frias mentioned, our annual Higher Education Leadership Conference is coming up uh, December 2nd and 3rd. And we're going to be excited to bring together higher education leaders from across the state in person uh, for uh, not only the uh, traditional new governing board uh, training, but also an expanded uh, slate of programming that's going to highlight uh, the work on the state strategic higher education plan. We're going to hear from uh, leading state and national experts on higher education, uh, discussions about how our institutions navigated the COVID-19 pandemic and have a number of terrific uh, speakers and panelists. So we're, we are looking forward to our leadership conference this year. So I have been looking forward to this board meeting for a while because our major policy discussion is going to be about our 60 by 30 Texas refresh work. So um, at the board's direction and with uh, the strong support and partnership from the Texas Higher Education Foundation, uh, we've been actively working for the past uh, year on a project to refresh the state's higher education plan, which is currently known as 60 by 30 Texas. So today you're going to hear about the new framework and about the major components that are going to be essential uh, for that refresh plan uh, and that we'll, uh, we are excited about how the, the, the the direction of the plan and uh, and are confident that will help empower all of our students to uh, 
uh, contribute to, participate in, and benefit from our world-class Texas economy. So the uh, work that you're going to hear today reflects um, the, uh, the hard work of, of our team, but also work in close partnership with our institutions, with employers across the state, and uh, with input from policymakers, senior uh, legislative staff, and also um, national higher education experts. So just as we did with the Closing the Gaps plan and then the 60 by 30 Texas plan, we think this uh, refreshed uh, plan is going to set out some important new directions for higher education uh, for Texas. Now, um, I'd like to provide just a brief update about the legislative session that just ended. The 87th uh, uh, Texas Legislature's third called uh, special session just adjourned this week, and it included a number of important provisions for higher education. So in particular, uh, lawmakers uh, approved uh, roughly $3.3 billion in uh, capital construction assistance projects. So these are the these were formerly known as tuition revenue bonds at our institutions of higher education. Those are outlined in Senate Bill 52 uh, by Senator Creighton, and uh, the sponsor is uh, Chairman Bonin on the House side. So the coordinating board will be tasked to distribute the debt service funding to the institutions, as we've done previously for capital projects. Um, we uh, This is something that our institutions have been uh, advocating for for a while. We have a number of uh, important projects with uh, this will uh, th these uh, capital uh, construction assistance projects are going to help address some um, important issues around deferred maintenance, other kind of research facilities, um, and other important projects on our campuses. Uh, lawmakers also approved distribution of billions of dollars in federal COVID-19 uh, relief funds in Senate Bill 8 uh, by Chairman uh, Bonin and uh, Senator Nelson. Uh, now, Senate Bill 8 uh, directs uh, funding to the coordinating board to support a number of higher education initiatives, including the debt service for the capital construction assistance projects. That includes $15 million for community colleges for the Texas reskilling and upskilling through education or TRUE program, uh, building on the investments that the coordinating board had secured uh, by commitments of GEAR funds with the governor and legislative leadership's uh, partnership. Then there's $20 million for comprehensive regional universities and performance-based funding for campuses uh, that serve um, high numbers of at-risk students. There's a million dollars for the Rural Veter Veterinarians Grant Program, and there's also $113 million for the Child Mental Health uh, Care Consortium that's administered by the UT system. Finally, Senate Bill 8 also included $50 million each uh, for Texas Tech University and for the University of Houston in institutional enhancement to continue to enhance and support those institutions' uh, research missions. Uh, next, I'd like to provide just a very brief update about GEAR-funded initiatives. Um, so uh, since August uh, 2020, the, uh, Governor Abbott and the legislative leadership have allocated now nearly $270 million for higher education in federal uh, governor's emergency education relief fund or GEAR fund. So Texas is one of a handful of states that's prioritized higher education with the GEAR fund. The majority of that funding has been allocated for uh, financial aid uh, to support students who are impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that includes uh, displaced workers and Texans who have some college but no credential who need to reskill and upskill to get back into the workforce or advance in their careers. Uh, these federal gear funds are also supporting uh, strategic investments on our campuses in digital learning, uh, college and career advising, and data modernization and security initiatives. So uh, today I'd like to highlight progress uh, across several of these gear funded initiatives that have direct impact for our institutions of higher education and our Texas students. Uh, so first, as I mentioned earlier, earlier this year we were able to allocate up to $25 million in GEAR funding to support our community colleges and our uh, uh, Texas State Technical Colleges and Lamar um, Colleges through the uh, Texas Reskilling and Upskilling Through Education or TRUE initiative. So this funding is intended to complement legislation that passed during the 87th legislature authored by Senator Creighton to support our two-year institutions in developing, redesigning, or expanding uh, programs for short-term credentials. So we uh, opened our request for applications um, at the beginning of September. We have 48 applications that represented 49 
institutions, and of those, 11 of those were applications for consortia. So we were very pleased uh, by the responses. Our colleges, from some of the smallest colleges to some of the largest colleges, stepped up and came together and uh, put um, some terrific applications together. Our staff is in the process of final review on these applications, and we expect to be able to make those announcements in the next few days. Um, as I mentioned earlier, now there's an additional $15 million that uh, has been allocated to the coordinating board by the legislature uh, where we're going to be able to make an additional round of distributions uh, to, to support our two-year institutions uh, through the TRUE initiative. Another initiative that was included in the first round of, uh, of GEAR funding uh, was our reskilling and upskilling uh, financial aid. So that uh, program was especially focused on financial support for re-enrolling students who'd stopped out or dropped out or displaced workers who might need some additional higher education uh, to be able to get back into the workforce um, and advance in their career. So we pr previously we had awarded $27.4 million across two rounds of grants with 49 institutions in the first round, 39 institutions in the second round. So we are um, about to award a third round and that third round of funding is going to total $19 million, and it will supplement these initial allocations of GEAR funding and expand the eligible institutions to now include all our, uh, our public institutions and also independent uh, nonprofit two- and four-year institutions and also our public and private uh, nonprofit health-related institutions. So that uh, round three application opened October 11th. It's going to close November 3rd. Uh, that uh, latest round also streamlined some of the application processes, streamlined some provisions around student eligibility uh, that we'd identified working in partnership with the institutions, and it allows for the inclusion of uh, uh, post-baccalaureate programs and graduate programs. So we're hopeful for a strong response uh, from our institutions around this financial aid, which will be timed to coincide with the work on the TRUE initiative and also on one final uh, initiative I'd like to highlight, which is called Accelerating Credentials of Purpose and Value. So this um, uh, program is going to be aimed at rapidly developing and, and uh, expanding short-term industry-recognized uh, credential programs in three areas um, around digital skills, data analytics, and programs for frontline healthcare workers. So these are, the, these are three areas that were identified by employers through our work on the 60 by 30 Texas goals as being uh, areas of concern for our talent pipeline for the state. So we're going to make available $12.5 million to all of our Texas public and private institutions to uh, expand their capacity or stand up new programs in these three broad fields. So that, that RFA for those grants is going to open earlier next week. So, um, so I'll close, but as you can see, we have, a, we have a ton of work underway at the Coordinating Board, particularly around the GEAR initiatives, but also um, thanks to uh, the 87th Texas Legislature for their investments in higher education. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Our next agenda item is public testimony. We do not have anyone registered to testify today, so we'll go on to the next item. And that item is uh, approval of minutes from previous meetings. Do I have a motion to approve the minutes of the July quarterly board meeting, which you've had in advance? So moved. Second. A, a motion by Mr. Wilson, a second by Ms. Schwartz. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition, say no. Motion passes. Next is a consent calendar. We are going to take up the consent calendar in two parts, the non-rule items and then the rule items. The consent calendar includes non-controversial items that we think we can be approved without uh, comment or discussion. Uh, this allows us to save time for other items that need more attention. Highlighted items in gray are the consent items on the agenda. You have had time in advance to review the items, and of course, any board member can request that an agenda item be removed from the consent calendar, and that we give this an opportunity to discuss that item or items fully later in the meeting. The items that we have placed on the non-rule consent today are 6F1, consideration of approval of contracts over $1 million, strategic planning and funding, uh, Damon Consulting Incorporated Temporary Personnel, uh, personnel Data Modernization Staff Augmentation Project, previously considered on our July 28, 2021, for a total of $2,867,067. Members, you have supplemental materials for this item printed on the goldenrod paper. 
Item 7B is consideration of approving the replacement of a member on the General Academic uh, Institution Formula Funding Advisory Committee and a member on the Health Related Institutions Formula Funding Advisory Committee for the 2024-2025 biennium. 7C is the review of facilities projects that were submitted to the Coordinating Board pursuant the Texas Education Code Section 61.0572 and 61.058. Item 7D, consideration of adopting the report on the student financial aid in Texas higher education fiscal year 2020. Item 7E, consideration of approving the appointment of members to the Financial Aid Advisory Committee. Item 9C, report to the board on the school closures and or teach outs pursuant to Rule 7.75. Item 9E, report activities to the Apply Texas Advisory Committee. Item 9F, the report on activities to the Advisory Council on Post-Secondary Education for Persons with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Item 9I, report on institutional requests related to new degree and certificate programs acted on by the Commissioner or Assistant Commissioners since our last board meeting. At this time, I would like to add Agenda Item 9G to the consent calendar. Agenda Item 9G is consideration of adopting the report on the effectiveness of the Advise Texas program. Members, do any one of you want to remove any item from the non-consent calendar? Hearing none, members, do anyone want to add items to the non-rule consent calendar? If not, do I have a motion for approval of the non-rule consent calendar as amended? Motion to approve. Uh, motion by Mr. Gaunt. Second. I, second by Ms. Williams. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposition saying no? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Members, the next item on the consent agenda are board rules. The rules placed on the consent calendar are those that are either technical, conforming, or implement non-controversial policies around which there is consensus. Members, the rules on consent calendar are the following. 7F1 is consideration of the repeal of the Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 17, Subchapters A through F, I, K, and L, concerning the resource planning and the possible adoption of new rules in Chapter 17 of the Board Rules concerning changes to the administrative administration of facilities audit, facilities inventory, energy savings performance contracts, board reports, institutional reporting on facility programs, and the organization of the aforementioned programs. Agenda item 9J1 is consideration of adopting proposed amendments to Texas Administrative Code Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 4, Subchapter A, Rule 4.8 of Board Rules concerning the excused absence of a person called to required military service. Agenda item 9J2 is consideration of adopting the proposed amendments to Rule 4.9 concerning limitations on the number of courses that may be dropped under certain circumstances by undergraduate students. Agenda item 9J4 is consideration of adopting the proposed repeal to Rule 5.51 concerning publishing of doctoral program data. Members, does anyone want to remove any of these items from the consent calendar? Do I have a motion to approve the rule consent calendar? Move. A motion by Ms. Williams. Do I have a second, please? Second. Second by Ms. Williams. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition, no? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. Next on our agenda is agenda item 5A is our major policy discussion. Major policy discussions are topics of interest for staff, Policy experts and or stakeholders provide coordinated board members with information on higher education policy matters or initiatives that have the potential to impact Texas statewide. The major policy discussion for this meeting will focus on 60 by 30 Texas revision update. Melissa Henderson. Hi, Melissa. Associate Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives will present this update and will be available for questions. Ms. Henderson, welcome. Thank you, Chairman Fedias and members. My name is Melissa Henderson, and I serve as the Associate Commissioner for Strategic Partnerships for the agency, as well as the Executive Director for the Texas Higher Education Foundation. As you know, we last fall, and as you heard the Commissioner describe, we launched a joint effort between the Coordinating Board and the Foundation to revise and refine the state's strategic plan to better incorporate four key dimensions. Promotion of research, development, and innovation, 
expanding our focus to include more attention to the needs of adult learners, prioritizing credentials of value that offer purpose in the economy, value in the labor market, and the opportunity for a good job, meaningful career, and low debt, and ensuring all Texans have equitable access to the information and resources they need so all Texans, as you heard the Commissioner describe, can participate in, contribute to, and benefit from our world-class economy. This work is comprised of two interrelated components, stakeholder engagement and the development of the revised indicators and goals. I'd like to start with a quick update on the robust stakeholder engagement work. Over the course of the last several months, we have worked to engage a variety of stakeholders across numerous types of activities you see referenced here. We continue to convene our steering committee made up of members representing this board and the foundation board. We hosted 10 virtual listening sessions across the state in partnership with colleges, universities, and chambers of commerce. Across these sessions, every institution in the state, two-year and four-year, public and private, was invited to engage with us in this important discussion, and we are grateful to our co-hosting institutions and to all the institutions that participated, as well as to the many other partners from business and industry, K-12, nonprofits, and philanthropy from across the state who participated and shared their perspective. With our virtual summit held in June, participants had the opportunity to hear not only from state and national leaders, but also from students directly about their experiences. Again, we thank our partnering institutions in providing us uh, video reels of those student experiences to share those incredible student stories. We've also engaged dozens of institutional leaders and state and national experts to understand the challenges and opportunities in each of these areas as well as promising practices. And we, of course, have looked to research and data to inform our thinking. Through our discussions with thought leaders across each of our focus areas, we had the opportunity to hear their thoughts on the issues that should be framing and informing our work. Here you see a very high level uh, description of some of what we heard from those many discussions. In the area of research and development, we spoke with institutional leaders and others engaged in this space and heard from them that while commercialization measures are, hard, are valuable, excuse me, they are also difficult to track. We also heard that it's important to consider inputs, process, and outputs. With regard to adult learners, we spoke with several organizations that have conducted research in this space or are involved in work aimed at upskilling and reskilling and heard from them the value of considering separate age brackets within our goals to encourage a focus on working age adults 35 to 64 without losing focus on the critical 25 to 34 year old population. We also heard that this approach could encourage differentiated strategies in recognition of different needs. Finally, in talking with institutional and system leaders, employers and researchers about credentials of value, we heard about the difficulties of mapping skills to credentials to occupations and the gaps there in our data. We heard about the data gaps in terms of what credentials are currently reported and tracked. We heard about the challenges of embedding micro-credentials within degrees, about the importance of considering debt in context of degree awarded, and finally, about the inconsistent use of labor market, uh, labor market data. Excuse me. Across these conversations and many others that the Commissioner has had over the last few weeks with presidents and chancellors, as well as through focus groups and other outreach, we've heard positive feedback about the direction of the revised plan and the importance of focusing on these areas. We are grateful to the many, many individuals who have shared with us their time and expertise to inform and shape this revision to the plan. Commissioner, anything you would add to that on our stakeholder engagement? Um, so, in, in particular, I, I want to say I appreciate the, uh, those deeper dive conversations with employers. Uh, we spend a lot of time normally talking with uh, higher education leaders across the state, and uh, we also um, spent a, a fair bit of time talking with the folks who are, are working on their, uh, their talent development and recruiting for major Texas employers across several different sectors. Um, those, as I mentioned earlier, those um, uh, takeaways were important not only for our higher education goals, but also uh, for shaping some of our work um, on that talent pipeline with the institution. So I particularly want to say that I appreciate that engagement with employers. Thank you, Commissioner. Finally, during our public comment period, we received two comments which are included in your board materials. With regard to the encouragement to ensure alignment with the Tri-Agency Initiative and other partner agencies, we've identified a few strategies that will be included in the revised plan. Establishing a statewide repository with information on all credentials offered by Texas institutions of higher education and other providers, including non-degree, high-value post-secondary credentials. Modernizing the state's educational and workforce data infrastructure, including improved collection of occupation-specific data, to my earlier point about the gaps in our existing data. 
to better inform students, educators, institutional leaders, employers, and the public about the talent pipeline while maintaining student privacy, and building upon the tri-agency efforts of the Coordinating Board, Texas Workforce Commission, and Texas Education Agency to provide timely and relevant information to stakeholders regarding changes in regional and state labor markets. Additionally, we would propose that the definition of credential of value encompass all types of credentials conferred by higher education institutions, not only traditional higher education credentials, such as the bachelor's degree or the doctoral degree, but also other types of credentials that help establish a path into the workforce, including certificates, apprenticeships, licenses, micro-credentials, and more. As we continue to refine our definition of credentials of value, we will aim to measure value by examining credentials in the context of median earnings and net cost of attendance. With regard to equitable outcomes and resource allocation, we would propose the following strategies to address this. Balance higher education funding strategically through a mix of state appropriations, tuition and fees, philanthropy, and other revenues, while leveraging state and federal financial aid to keep student debt low. And make the costs of higher education more transparent, predictable, and affordable for Texas students and bolster their financial literacy. Finally, with regard to the pipeline of post-secondary completion, we would propose this strategy. Streamline students' paths to credentials of value through course and program redesign, new pedagogical tools, credit for prior learning, and flexible program options, while increasing support services that, and advising that help students through key transitions in higher education and the workforce, and expand high-quality work-based learning opportunities through partnerships among institutions and employers, including paid internships and apprenticeships. I'd like to now shift to how, as a result of our research and stakeholder engagement, we are identifying indicators in each of these areas for the revised strategic plan, building a talent-strong Texas, fostering the skills, and spurring the innovation vital to the Texas economy. As you see here, we propose to amend our current attainment goal and add new goals around productions of credentials of value and promotion of research, development, and innovation. Additionally, across all of these, we propose that where possible, data, data for these indicators be disaggregated and tracked by race, gender, income level, and geographic area to ensure that all goals are achieved equitably and all Texans have an opportunity to succeed. We also know that increasing attainment, production, and promotion will require coordination across the public and private sectors with input from, and support from educators and institutional leaders policymakers and employers, and students and families. Within each area, you will see recommendations for both primary and future indicators. Primary indicators are those that can be collected and tracked today based on current data availability. You heard, however, across these areas that there are currently gaps in the data we collect. Because of this, the data we collect and report will continually evolve. As such, we aim to also evolve our indicators for each of the three goals to ensure that we have a robust and timely understanding of the ongoing impact. This includes identifying and collecting data for some indicators that have not traditionally been tracked. What we are bringing to you today is an update on where we are in determining what we want, propose to measure based on our extensive stakeholder engagement, research, and landscape analysis. What you will not yet see in this presentation are numeric targets associated with those indicators. As we first want to propose to you our current and best thinking on the indicators themselves, and then work in close partnership with institutions and other stakeholders to determine the right target. Commissioner, anything you would add to that? So there are a couple of um, markers that we're going to put down that, uh, that I just want to highlight as being uh, amb uh, ambitious, where um, we're, uh, we have had goals that are set to primarily in terms of sort of generic educational attainment, uh, where, where we count all credentials for one. So we, we are uh, recommending that we expand the scope of credentials uh, that we include. We expand those definitions, but uh, we would be um, uh, we would be a pioneer in connecting data about those credentials to the uh, wage premium associated with those credentials. So the so the heart of the discussion that we're transitioning into now is talking not just generically about credentials, but credentials of value credentials that translate into uh, meaningful uh, returns on that investment of time and resources for individual Texans and communities in the state. So, um, so I'll de defer to Melissa as we, as we transition into it. Um, but, uh, but again, also to highlight that we're, so we're presenting the new architecture, the new framework, and then uh, what we anticipate is coming back to the board in January with recommendations 
from the steering committee about specific targets. Thank you, Commissioner. So digging into the first area, attainment of post-secondary credentials, you'll see that this is the most straightforward of the three. It's also where we are proposing to incorporate the focus on adult learners. What you see here is the attainment forecast for 25 to 34 year olds. In 2019, the last year for which this data is available, we were at 45.32% and we are projected to be at 54.49% in 2030. One way in which we would like to consider continuing to refine this moving forward, as you heard the Commissioner describe, as we gather more data on other types of credentials of value, is to evolve what is counted toward this goal. For example, we are exploring what data might exist currently on certifications that could potentially be incorporated. Similarly, you see here the attainment forecast for 35 to 64-year-olds. In 2019, we were at 44.48% and we are projected to be at 52.83% in 2030 based on what is currently counted within this. We recommend maintaining an indicator focused on the percent of Texans aged 25 to 34 with a degree or certificate by 2030. We also recommend adding or other post-secondary credential of value, the language you see in italicized here, to allow for evolution of what is captured and counted over time. Additionally, we recommend adding an indicator focused on the percent of Texans ages 25, excuse me, 35 to 64 with a degree, certificate, or other post-secondary credential of value. Finally, we recommend adding a future indicator of the number of unfilled high and middle skilled jobs in high demand and or high growth industries as we're able to collect and track this data. Commissioner, anything you want to add before we move on to the next area? So, um, so uh, we, uh, again, just uh, to highlight, so there's, there's two things going on. One is expanding the age range uh, for, for population, so we bring in the older Texans, and we're also then bringing in a broader range of credentials, but conditioned on those credentials being credentials of value. So both of those would be ambitious. Uh, as you can see from the projections, we're not currently on track to meet our current 60 by 30 Texas goals. So that's going to mean that we're going to have to, uh, we're going to, have to double down on our uh, engagement and, and enrollment of students. Uh, we're particularly uh, going to have to work with our institutions on having more flexible short-term uh, credentials that are valuable for individuals um, and align with current emerging workforce needs. Uh, so, so we're not backing off of the 60 by 30 Texas goal. We're actually raising the bar. So looking now to our next area, promotion of research, development, and innovation, you'll recall that from our thought leader conversations, this is an area where our current data collection is relatively limited. One measure that we currently collect is research expenditures. What we heard repeatedly was that federal and industry-sponsored research in particular are reasonably good proxies for quality of research. Here you see the figures for each of those two types, federal and private, for 2020 and where those are projected to be by 2030, both of which are projected to increase. For a bit of quick context, from our landscape analysis, relatively few states include R&D measures in their state higher education plans. Of those that do, North Carolina, Florida, and Georgia are the most similar in their approach, and all three use research expenditures as a component of what they measure. These research activities simultaneously drive the global economy and provide Texas students, including undergraduates, with opportunities to work at the frontiers of human knowledge. An additional method for measuring that contribution is through the production of doctoral graduates, and in particular, research doctoral graduates. Taking these and other factors into account, our recommendation is to add two primary indicators in this area. First, to increase annual private and federal research and development expenditures. Second, to increase the number of research doctorates awarded yearly by Texas institutions of higher education. Additionally, we recommend incorporating measures of commercialization, knowledge transfer, and economic impact over time as that data is available. Commissioner, anything you'd like to add? So the research mission was uh, part of the Closing the Gaps plan. So uh, the plan uh, before our current one did include uh, targets around the research mission, but that was dropped uh, when, uh, in 2015, the 60 by 30 Texas plan was adopted. So the six focus of the 60 by 30 Texas plan was really um, on the educational mission. But of course, uh, as the disruptions of the last uh, uh, 20 months or so have uh, have illustrated the economy is moving much faster than anyone anticipated in the direction of higher skills, higher credentials, and um, it's incre increasingly important 
that Texas, if we're going to remain competitive, uh, invest in our research and development infrastructure. I mentioned before how this is a priority of the governor. It's a priority of the uh, legislature. And so it's striking that our higher education goals currently are entirely silent on that part of the mission. So um, so as part of the uh, refresh, we will be bringing back in to uh, the uh, higher education uh, strategic plan um, targets around the research and development mission, but focused on uh, things that are hard to game, the kind of like private capital or uh, federal uh, grant dollars that are competitive, and also then the production of of research doctorates uh, from our institutions as an indicator of the strength of the graduate programs uh, within those institutions. So this is a new direction for our 60 by 30 Texas plan. Thank you, Commissioner. Finally, we come to our final area, production of credentials of value. This is the area that has perhaps pushed our thinking the most as we have worked to move from a focus on completion to one on completion with purpose and value, as you heard the Commissioner describe. This work starts with the notion that the credentials that students earn must, at a minimum, provide a positive return on investment, in that their economic benefits exceed the cost to receive them. Credential holders earn more than those who haven't earned credentials while also maintaining manageable debt, and students leave higher education better off financially than they would otherwise be. We have already laid a strong foundation for the Texas workforce over the past two decades by increasing post-secondary attainment. However, the modern economy demands more that we award credentials that offer purpose in the economy, value in the labor market, and opportunity for a good job and meaningful career. The COVID-19 pandemic vividly demonstrated how quickly specific jobs and marketable skills can change. Credentials from Texas institutions of higher education, therefore, must propel graduates into lasting successful careers that equip them for continued learning and greater economic mobility. This is not an uncomplicated landscape, however. To begin, credential is a broad term that encompasses degrees and certificates, but also badges, apprenticeships, and industry certifications, among others. Here you see a sample of just some of those types of credentials, again, widely varied in scope, definition, breadth, and depth. Some are offered by institutions of higher education, some are not. Some are awarded for academic credit, some are not. Some are currently reported to and tracked by the state, some are not. Further adding to this complexity is the fact that even within the same credential, certificates, for example, there are various definitions, none of which may, uni may be universally agreed upon. Finally, to my earlier point, there is relatively limited data that we currently collect beyond degrees and certificates awarded, employment and wages data, and debt to wage ratio. In other words, there's much we don't yet collect and therefore have clear line of sight into in this space. This is a great area of interest, however, both for our work and that of others. The Tri-Agency Initiative, for example, has a priority to support efficient and flexible pathways to earning high-value credentials linked to high-wage in-demand jobs. Additionally, the Texas Credentials for the Future Task Force, which includes leadership from the Coordinating Board, the Workforce Commission, the UT system and institutions, and companies in Texas focused on reskilling and upskilling, is also working across a number of related goals to develop a more robust and labor market aligned credential landscape within institutions. Finally, the agency recently released an RFA, as you heard earlier, for the Accelerating Credentials of Purpose and Value. This GEAR-funded grant program will provide resources to support the development and or expansion of embedded credentials into existing programs or developing new curriculum to ensure that students gain valuable skills while pursuing their degree program. As you heard earlier, this funding will support efforts at the undergraduate and graduate level in, in three areas that came out of m many of our conversations with employers, as the commissioner described. One of the key challenges, as we've alluded to earlier, is the disconnect between the data we currently collect on credentials and a fuller understanding of the overall credentialing landscape and how those credentials align to workforce demands. Students lack clarity on value of certain credentials, employers lack ways to validate skills associated with various credentials, and institutions lack up-to-date data to inform program offerings and innovation. To address this, we are also leveraging GEAR funds to develop a credential repository and framework for validation that will provide a clear line of sight for students, employers, and institutions of higher education by knitting together transparent data and information from disparate sources. This work is just beginning and will be a key cornerstone as we continue to evolve our work in this space. 
As we looked across the nation to understand the landscape of work being conducted in this area around defining and measuring value within post-secondary education, we found the work of the Post-Secondary Value Commission to be very illuminating. This commission, convened by the Institute for Higher Education Policy, brought together a wide range of stakeholders, higher education practitioners, and researchers to develop a framework for defining and measuring value and partnered with the UT system to understand the impact of the thresholds using institutional data. Over the course of nearly two years, the commission developed a framework for defining, measuring, and promoting the value conferred by post-secondary education on individual students and society. Their work sets out a series of six thresholds to measure economic returns of a post-secondary credential, allowing for an analysis of whether post-secondary education delivers an equitable return on investment and supports upward mobility. The first of these thresholds is known as threshold zero and measures whether graduates of an institution are better off financially than they would have been otherwise had they not attended. While the goals of higher education are many, including economic opportunity and mobility among others, setting a threshold of value of positive return on investment tied to wages and debt is a bold step. Texas would be, as you heard the commissioner say, the first state in the nation to take this on and set a policy goal tied to completion with value. The value of an individual credential can also be increased by targeting financial aid to ensure that opportunities are affordable and student debt is low. Manageable student debt is essential to expand economic mobility for historically underserved populations who have often had the greatest needs but the least access to higher education and support services. This combination of increased value and economic mobility for students also translates into greater economic prosperity for their families, communities, and the state. As such, we are recommending two primary indicators in this area, one focused on completion with value and one focused on no and manageable debt. Additionally, we are recommending a future indicator to track the number of students graduating with credentials linked to high demand occupations as our data continues to evolve. Commissioner, anything you'd like to add on this area? So again, I'm so excited about this work and where we are now in the, and grateful to the, to the foundation and to the board uh, for um, uh, helping us get to this point. So, so again, just to underline a couple of, uh, of the important points here. So Texas, um, with this new direction, would be the first state uh, to set higher education goals that uh, are connected directly with the earnings premium that are associated with credentials. Of course, we have incredibly rich data uh, as a state, and uh, this, this uh, leverages the in investments of the, uh, the governor and the legislative leadership and the coordinating board in enhancing and modernizing that ed educational and workforce data and inf infrastructure. Yesterday, we had the chance to get an update on that report uh, uh, from uh, Lori Fye we will uh, make that data increasingly accessible and visible uh, to students and families, to institutions about what the career trajectories look like and what the earnings are associated with different kinds of credentials. We are working in close partnership with the Texas Workforce Commission to stand up a state credential repository that includes a broad range of post-secondary credentials with a standard taxonomy so we can connect this data not just for the traditional degrees and certificates, but also for a broader range of short-term credentials, um, uh, industry-recognized credentials, um, and other kinds of things that we're not currently tracking today. Um, this is uh, going to be important for uh, informing, for guiding our work, of course, at the uh, at the agency, and that's already underway, particularly as it as it uh, pertains to our work on college and career advising and uh, getting information out uh, to students. We, when we polled uh, Texans who had some college or no credential and displaced workers during uh, the height of the pandemic, what a lot of uh, uh, folks uh, told us, and it was a surprise to me, uh, was that while cost was a barrier, on the same magnitude were issues related to advising. Folks might need, know that they, they might need some additional training, some additional education to advance in their careers, but they weren't sure what kind of uh, education they should pursue or how that might lead to a better job. Uh, the coordinating board is taking point on this issue for the state and for the tri-agency initiative and guided by uh, this work. Also, uh, we would mentioned a couple of times specific C grants uh, that we'll be administering 
through this agency to help expand the range of short-term credentials that are offered uh, to students. And it's not as, it, I, I should, I, I should also just as an aside, traditionally we've had sort of this bright line between what happens on the sort of workforce education side and what happens on the academic uh, side. That's uh, that's breaking down, and and I think it's and I think it needs to break down so that we're going to see more and more students who are picking up multiple credentials. So they're picking up uh, while they're enrolled in traditional degree programs, they might be picking up other kinds of short-term credentials that have real value and expand their job opportunities, or you might have folks who are picking up multiple short-term credentials that can be stacked and converted into credits that count towards uh, degree programs. Finally, um, I, I also wanted to highlight how uh, important this work is for policy in two important areas. So we're, recomm we're recommending an indicator uh, first that we, uh, that we focus our discussions around debt um, uh, in, on students who have either low debt or no debt. Uh, so currently we have a debt goal as part of 60 by 30 Texas, but it's, it's fairly abstract. It's the percentage of students whose debt doesn't exceed 60% of their first year wages, which is sort of hard to interpret. Um, it's not, and it's not sure what sort of, uh, it, it, it's not clear what, what uh, kind of policy decisions you ought to make, that kind of thing. So instead, uh, what we'll be recommending is a more intuitive notion of either students who don't have any debt at all. Now we have about 56% of our students graduate with no debt. Uh, or students have low debt, and low debt uh, should be measured in terms of the expected earnings premium of that student's credential. So if we look on average, what's that credential going to be worth versus with the student's debt? So it could vary depending on the kind of credential that a student has. So we might uh, think very differently about uh, two students, one of whom has um, $30,000 in debt, but they're graduating with a degree in social work, and another student has $30,000 uh, in debt, and they're graduating with a degree in computer science. There's very different expected earnings trajectories. So the measure of what would count as high debt should be different depending on the kind of credentials uh, that students have. and. Um, Included in that notion of high debt or no debt also is an emphasis on the shared responsibility among the uh, students and their families, the institutions, and also the state of Texas in ensuring that uh, higher, these higher education credentials are going to be accessible and affordable. Of course, the coordinating board is the main advocate for our need-based financial aid programs, and we were grateful to the legislature for providing an additional $110 million in uh, financial aid um, uh, this, this past session. But that, that translates into only 56% of eligible students uh, being able to receive Texas grant, for example. So if the state doesn't maintain and hopefully improve its uh, commitment to need-based financial aid, what that's gonna translate into is more students having high and unsustainable uh, levels of debt uh, when they uh, complete their credentials. And then finally, uh, we, we touched on a little bit in our discussion yesterday, but there's a direct connection also that uh, will highlight between the, the goals and discussions about finance. So we wanna make sure that the, the ways our institutions are supported, the way that they're funded, uh, should reflect and advance the goals. Where right now, uh, to be candid, uh, we have friction uh, between our state goals and our uh, and our uh, finance system. So, as students streamline, uh, as students' uh, pathways are streamlined and they reduce their excess semester credit hours, as institutions uh, partner uh, to improve transferability of credits, the institutions can actually lose funding in the current system. So we want to make sure that we get those incentives aligned uh, in the interests of the students and, the, and uh, the institutions and the state so that we can move faster to realize the kinds of ambitious goals that we're setting out. So uh, longer than I, than I wanted to talk, but again, I'm, I'm so excited about, enthusiastic about this work, deeply grateful uh, to our partners in the, in the Capitol and our institutions and our employers for helping uh, get us to this point. Thank you, Commissioner. So just to wrap up quickly, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to present to you today that architecture for how we're thinking about the plan. 
these represent, again, our best thinking based on the data we currently collect and how we aim to evolve that over time. And, and uh, it really has been informed by our conversations with stakeholders from across the state and across the nation. Our aim now is to work in close partnership with institutions and other stakeholders over the coming weeks to continue to refine definitions and methodologies and to set targets. And with that, Chairman, Fadias, and members, I'm happy to take any questions. Or the commissioners, happy to take any questions. <clears throat> Thank you for that <laughs> excellent presentation, Ms. Henderson. Um, members on the coordinating board, this has been um, really a great, great um, collaboration uh, with the Texas Higher Education Foundation. Uh, and Mr. Neil Adams, who we will hear from shortly, uh, co-chaired this committee. And thank you to all the eight steering board members, the committee members. Uh, this has been a work in project for over almost a year, over a little close to over a year, uh, regular meetings. And thank you to a, a couple of members on our board that served on that. And Mr. Wilson was on that, uh, uh, myself, um, and we also had foundation members on it. Uh, and as a commissioner, thank you for leader, your leadership uh, and input on that. And uh, there's so many stakeholders, and uh, you know, I was very proud to see the work of the steering committee include all factions of the state. Um, as Ms. Henderson mentioned, there were Chamber of Commerce, there were meetings at institutions all over all regions of the state. So I felt really, really good about having the great input. Uh, and this is a huge policy uh, for the future of our state in higher education. Uh, and as the commissioner said, I'd also like to thank the legislature for their support and their staffs in this uh, endeavor. And that's what I call it, because this is really the future uh, of our state in higher education. Uh, so members, just, just to let you know that there was a lot of work, a lot of input, uh, a lot of stakeholder input into this uh, important policy. And uh, I thank the partnership with the foundation. We'll hear the details today of the annual report from the foundation from Mr. Adams. Uh, and Melissa, thank you, and your staff by the way, who we worked very closely with as well for all the hard work that they have done. So uh, this is not some, nothing to gloss over. This is, this is very important because this is our, our plan. And uh, so I think that, they, that everyone has done a really great job on it. So members, if you have any questions, this is an opportunity to ask uh, Ms. Henderson and anyone else that was on, that's here that's on the steering committee uh, or the commissioner uh, if you want more detail on it. But um, thank you for all the work for everyone that was involved. Thank you, Chairman. So uh, just a comment to echo uh, our chairman. Uh, I want to thank you, Melissa, for keeping us all on task, uh, which was no small order. So we appreciate all that and all your work and your staff. Uh, you guys really did a great job. Uh, I'm intrigued by the notion of the stackable credentials, which uh, each credential in and of itself has value, but, we, but to create a program to stack them on top of each other, which creates further value. Uh, so I'm very intrigued with that notion, and I think there's a huge opportunity uh, for the students if we can help uh, move that forward. And then lastly, to echo what the commissioner said, the, the, the real goal is to align the incentives to where all of the incentives in the whole industry are aligned uh, for, for a great result. So uh, great work on that and discussion, but that's really, if we can get that done, then uh, we'll have done a lot. So thank you very much. Right. Any other comments or questions for the commissioner or for Ms. Henderson? I just want to mention the, the, the data piece and the value of the data. It's so hard to create a plan and measure your um, performance against that plan when you don't have clear and good data. And also just the value of the data to the students and the families and the parents of these kids. Um, so so just I, I think it's uh, a great opportunity that we've had the, the financing to be able to advance a data modernization project. So. Absolutely. Great job. And Thank you. To, just to pick up on one aspect of that, uh, just you'll notice we've got our our primary indicators and our and the future facing indicators that we're recommending. There, um, there are a number of places where we wish we had better data than we have today. So it's it's not, uh, for example, on on that full range of the short term credentials, the industry recognized credentials that we're talking about. Uh, so just to be clear, and just for everyone listening, it's not as if we have that data and we're not sharing it. Uh, it's not, in, in many cases, it's not even as if the institutions themselves collect uh, data on the full range of credentials that they offer. So it's going to take a lot of work uh, in partnership with the uh, institutions, uh, in partnership with employers, 
and then, uh, and then I especially appreciate the partnership with our Texas Workforce Commission in standing up a credential repository. So this is going to be dynamic. We'll have to keep coming back to the board with updates about uh, what uh, kinds of credentials we're able to collect uh, data on with recommendations about how we might need to iterate on the goals as a result. All right. So again, this is a refresh. Of course, this is very important because of the pandemic and we've had to pivot and look at all the options of higher education. So this is great. This refresh is what we're proposing uh, for the board to approve of this plan. So do I have a motion to approve the revision of the plan? So moved. Moved by Mr. Wilson. Do I have a second? Second. Second by, was Mr. Gaunt? Correct. Okay. All in favor? Any discussion, first of all? This is a very important uh, proposal, so I want to make sure we have room for discussion and everyone has uh, reviewed it or has uh, any questions. If not, members, do I have uh, all those in favor? Of, uh, please signify by saying aye. We'll have a vote here. Aye. 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 Any opposition? No. Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Ms. Henderson, for the report and the great work. Thank you, Chairman. Next on our agenda item is matters relating uh, to the full board. Uh, agenda item 6A is an update on the Texas Higher Education Foundation. Mr. Adams can come forward. Neil Adams is chairman and president of, of the Texas Higher Education Foundation. We'll, he'll present this item be available for questions. Ms. Melinda Henderson, executive director of the Texas Higher Education Foundation, will also be available for questions. Mr. Adams, welcome. Mr. Adams has uh, been a uh, member of the coordinating board, vice chair, and he has a lot of experience in higher education. So um, I have the privilege of serving on the foundation. We have he's put together a great foundation board, and uh, it has really, really taken off in the last uh, two years uh, with the addition of uh, Ms. Anderson and, and the great staff and the great new members that we have, and he's going to give us an update on the foundation. Welcome, Neil. Howdy, and good morning. Chairman, and Madam Vice Chair, and members of the board, uh, I feel like I'm, when I come back to speak, it's, uh, I'm coming back home, having sat up there for, for six years, part of this, this, uh, this organization. And uh, I, uh, ah, there we go. <laughs> Got to turn me on. <laughs> <laughs> I talk pretty loud anyway, so uh, as Mr. Torn knows. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here again uh, representing the uh, Texas Higher Education Foundation. Uh, let me give you a little background. I know you have two members, new members to this board. Um, uh, when, I was on, when I came on the coordinating board in 2001 in August, uh, the coordinating board back in the spring of 2001 formed this foundation. Back then it was called the College for All Texans Foundation. The intent of the foundation was to um, form a foundation that would have members on that foundation that would have uh, spheres of influence, relationships that could open door for philanthropic support of higher ed. Uh, most private foundations, corporate foundations across America that support higher ed or other issues don't, don't wish to give money to a state agency of which the coordinating board obviously is. So the private foundation theory was that let's form a foundation that uh, would solicit and, uh, and hopefully uh, raise funds that could support initiatives that this board and this commissioner uh, would from time to time uh, create to uh, make a difference in higher ed in this state. Uh, I believe we've met that obligation. I think we are much more uh, uh, adapt in what we do, and I give full credit to Commissioner Keller and Ms. Henderson. Uh, when Commissioner came here in 2019, um, uh, one of the first things that I heard from him, uh, actually indirectly, was a call from Stu uh, Stedman, who was your, your chair at the time, and said, Neil, uh, uh, Commissioner and I would like to sit down and visit with you uh, about the role of the foundation and its members. Uh, and we arranged that meeting in November of 2019, uh, really just about six weeks after uh, Harrison became commissioner, and that was about a two- to three-hour meeting. Uh, what came out of that meeting was really exciting for me and I know for the members of my foundation board, uh, is that Harrison would, did, wanted to expand the role of, of the foundation and that 
the foundation become a partner with the Higher Education Coordinating Board. We felt like we were there for raising money, but uh, Commissioner Keller wanted to expand that to involve policy. Um, a prime example of that is something that uh, Chairman Ferris mentioned just a few minutes ago was the Refresh uh, Working Group that had members of this uh, board as well as the Foundation Board, uh, Fred Heldenfels, Woody Hunt, uh, and Daryl Heath and myself served on that and uh, uh, that working group. The exciting thing about that and those listening sessions across the state was the significant input not only from higher ed and public ed, but from the workforce side. Corporate Texas needed to step up and needs to step up to be a part of what's happening in terms of the future of education in this state, both public and higher ed. And I think this, these working groups have opened some doors. And uh, Melissa and I have talked about this and the commissioner is that those listening groups and those chambers of commerce, those uh, corporate executives that we engaged in this process, uh, that we continue that, that that not just be a one-time thing to come back and refresh the statewide policy, but that we have an ongoing dialogue. We're producing in higher ed we're producing their workforce, and we've not done a good job, in my opinion, through the years of really working together as to identifying what those needs are. I think the pandemic created that because of how they change, how they do, how, how their workforce changes in terms of how they work, uh, how higher education delivers higher education uh, needs. So I, I think, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Keller, thank you for taking advantage of uh, what I think are some pretty significant individuals uh, on this uh, now 18 member board, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, let's, let's talk about the board. Uh, prior to Tuesday, we had 14 board members. Uh, we now have 18, and I'll talk about those four new ones in a moment. Um, I think if you look across the spectrum of this board, uh, and you can sort of roll the slides till you get to the last one there. But uh, 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 one of the things I wanted to give you a little background, uh, the bylaws require the foundation that 51% of the foundation board be appointed by the chairman of the courting board. The other 49% are elected by the board itself. Of the 18 members, and I'll include the four, uh, four new ones, 10 are current or former members of this coordinating board. Four are current or former chairs of this coordinating board. Three are current or former vice chairs of this board. Six are current or former setting uh, members of university or community college board of regents. So that gives you a, a perspective about who we are. But more importantly, I think the thing, and I appreciate Commissioner Keller and Stu Stedman for this, is looking at the wealth of experience um, passion for higher ed that sets on this board and then taking advantage of that. Uh, we all, every one of all 18 members of this board now have relationships in Austin on the Hill and in Washington. Some of them varying relationships. Some of them are very important relationships that the commissioner has been able to take advantage of as we went through this last uh, legislative session. Let me focus a little bit on our four new members, and I'd like to personally welcome uh, Ms. Williams and, uh, and Mr. Wilson to the board, uh, two of our new, four of our new board members. Uh, uh, Ms. Williams and I go way back, particularly with her husband. Tell Michael I said hello. Uh, and she brings a wealth of talent to this board. Uh, her background uh, in, uh, in the mechanical engineering, graduate of Prairie View A&M. Uh, she's currently managing a huge project and the upgrade of, of the Bush, of, of, uh, 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 the Houston George Bush uh, International Airport. Uh, and so uh, welcome, Donna, to our board. We Thank look forward you. to working with you. Thank you very much. And then uh, welcome Wilson as well. Welcome, welcome to the board. Uh, he brings a wealth of talent and experience. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, he's CEO of Welcome Group. Uh, He's a member of the Greater uh, Houston Partnership, and, and, and important to the foundation, as you'll see in a moment, is his membership on the Trellis Foundation. And, and welcome, thank you for your, your support and the Trellis Foundation support of the Higher Ed Foundation, as you'll see in some of the slides that, that Melissa's going to go through. 
In addition to those two board members, we have two new board members that were elected last Tuesday. Uh, uh, Suzanne Plummer, graduate of Rice University in Double E. She's a corporate vice president of design engineering of advanced micro devices, and I looked through her resume, and I don't understand what she does. That's beyond my, my, my comprehension, but uh, she does a lot of important things, uh, much like uh, Ms. Williams uh, does as well. But uh, she's going to bring, a, I think, uh, a wealth of relationships, an input, and talent to the foundation board that we haven't had. And then last but not least is a good friend of mine, and, and I think Sam Torn knows Will Frazier. General Frazier is a retired five-star general in the Air Force, former chief of staff of the, of the Air Force, very actively involved in educate, pub, higher education for the military uh, in all branches of the military subsequent to his retirement. Uh, he's a graduate of Texas A&M University and holds uh, master's degrees from numerous universities across the country. Uh, and all four of these folks add to the passion about higher ed and making a difference for, for the young men and women of the state of Texas. And again, welcome, and Donna, welcome to the, to the board. We look forward to working with you. At this time, I want to talk a little bit about uh, staff. We couldn't do what we do if it wasn't for staff. And in fact, we do very little. Uh, Melissa and her staff does all of it. Uh, and I uh, appreciate, uh, uh, I tell you, uh, having uh, chaired or been a part of trustees in various organizations across uh, the spectrum, uh, uh, the staff's what makes it happen. And that's true of the coordinating board, that's true of the foundation. And, and Melissa Henderson, uh, Commissioner Keller, you blessed me by bringing this young lady along. She has a, a, has a marvelous background. I think a lot of the success that we've had since 2019 is attributable to uh, Commissioner uh, Keller and, and to, to uh, Ms. Henderson. They brought a wealth of relationships. Uh, and, and across the private sector, uh, private foundations across the country that have, as you'll see in a moment, contributed over $8.2 million uh, in philanthropic support to higher ed since January 1 of 2020. Now think about that. We came through that pandemic and raised $8.2 million to support your initiatives. And by the way, we, we, we're your foundation. We're, we're here because of you. And, and, and the initiatives, and, and we're here to support those policies and initiatives and hopefully help them be successful. I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, my right arm, uh, uh, Ms. Henderson. She's going to make some comments. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Chairman and Board members. So. As Neil described, uh, and as you guys know well, the role of the foundation is, is a few things. One, of course, to raise funds to support strategic initiatives of the agency, to facilitate partnerships with philanthropy, uh, to manage the contracts and grants associated with those partnerships, and to collaborate really closely, and, and I truly mean that. Uh, it, we, we see the role of the foundation as a strategic partner to the agency. So working closely with our colleagues across the agency with staff and leadership on key strategic initiatives and higher ed policy. Um, and as Neil mentioned, the foundation has raised over $26 million since 2001 and nearly 8.3 of that since January of last year. And I think the, the value of the foundation is really that combination of leveraging public resources and private resources to improve outcomes. And we'll talk a little bit about examples of that. But I think this combination of having the flexibility of what philanthropy can provide and the catalytic investments that philanthropy can provide with the type of public resources, uh, particularly right now with the gear resources that, that the commissioner has been able to secure, has created a really powerful combination that has allowed us to go farther faster on a number of key strategic initiatives. So here's a quick snapshot of those current awards uh, by project and by funder. And you'll see here that, that it, it spans a wide variety of projects. So I think of the work of the foundation in kind of three key areas. One, um, I think there's a, a great flexibility that the foundation provides. So if you look on the, the right-hand side of the screen, the Texas Emergency Aid Grant Program is a program that we stood up very quickly early on in the pandemic last year. 
um, prior to the passage of the CARES Act and then throughout the, dis the disbursement of the CARES Act resources. And partnering with a variety of foundations, what this allowed us to do was to award, and you'll see here in a little bit, 84 grants to institutions, public and private, two-year and four-year across the state to provide flexible resources for them to be able to, to fill gaps in their emergency aid programs and to have those resources available for students when they need them. And that's a, an, ex, an example of a program where the foundation uh, is able to create that program, partner with philanthropy to stand it up, award those grants, get those grants out the door, and kind of manage that completely within the team. The, other, the, the second type of program that I would highlight is uh, the strategic planning effort. So create, having the ability to have flexible resources to support the agency in foundational projects like strategic planning where last year and early this year we partnered with philanthropy to identify resources to um, secure consulting to be able to develop a strategic architecture specifically for the agency. And I think of that as kind of a second type of project. And then the third, which I would say um, not to pick a favorite child, but to pick a favorite child, uh, is to work really closely with my colleagues across the agency to build on those strategic initiatives in the way that I described, where we're able to identify and secure philanthropic resources to be able that, that are more flexible and are catalytic in nature. And I think the Data Infrastructure Modernization Initiative is a key example of this where by having those flexible catalytic resources, we're able to secure um, high quality planning, design, consulting resources, marketing and communications resources that, that really bolster the impact of the public resources that we have available for implementation. Before you move on that, I, again, welcome. Thank you for your foundation trellis that you serve on. Now you see there, there's a couple of where, uh, places where trellis has stepped up and supported these initiatives, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. So just to real quickly touch on some of the key initiatives that the foundation is supporting. So again, starting with data modernization, I think is a, is a key example. And you can see here both the funds raised as well as the work streams that are being supported by those philanthropic resources. So you know whether that's data governance, whether that's website redesign, um, stakeholder and change management, data infrastructure assessment, uh, the types of things that we're able to support through those philanthropic resources. So with GradTex 2.0 and MyTexas Future, we have several partners engaged in that work across a variety of work streams, um, talk, uh, helping build out the student portal, providing technical analyses from key national partners, marketing communication support, some of the polling work that the commissioner referenced earlier. And, that, and in addition, I would say, even though these work streams are supporting this specific project. There are also implications across projects. So as you heard the commissioner describing the polling work that we did through this project in polling individuals with some college no credential, that has informed other areas of work as well. Again, the strategic planning work that, that we were able to secure resources for to develop a strategic architecture for the agency itself to really put a framework around our strategic initiatives and our priorities. Um, a newer area, the Community College Finance Commission, which um, will be launching soon, but having resources available to support facilitation of that work. Critically, policy and technical analyses, which we're also leveraging gear funds for. And then again, stakeholder engagement and communications, two areas that we know are critical to so many areas of this work uh, and that philanthropy is really well suited to, to support. And then finally, to my very first example, the Texas Emergency Aid Grant Program, which we stood up last year in partnership with a number of foundations and individual donors. Uh, again, 84 awards to, or I'm sorry, 84 awards to institutions, public, private, two-year, four-year, to give them um, flexible resources and to be able to report back to us what that impact was on student persistence. Could I, could I yeah. just highlight on the emergency aid in particular, because folks might look at that and say, well, those are pretty small grants. How could how, how could that have that much of an impact? Um, so, so the context uh, for the emergency aid grant program. So this this was launched early on uh, in the in the uh, initial disruption from the pandemic. Uh, when um, and we what we found is about half of our institutions across the state did not have systems and processes in place to distribute emergency aid to students. So even as uh, there was funding that public funding that was uh, that was going to be coming in stimulus funding from the CARES Act. Um, we had about half of our institutions that wouldn't be able to di distribute that aid strategically. So they there were some of the institutions were considering 
just sort of sending out a flat allocation to every student enrolled because they didn't have other kinds of of uh, um, uh, uh, capabilities. So, so one of the most important ways that uh, the emergency grant uh, uh, program through the foundation was important. Yes, the, there were some of the institutions that were able to use it uh, to fill some gaps for direct aid for students, but a number of uh, of these institutions used it uh, to quickly implement new systems and processes so they could distribute aid more strategically to students in the in the uh, much larger um, investments of federal stimulus dollars that came to those institutions. Then the two things I would add to that, um, so one, building on that, we also partnered with Trellis to host a series of webinars for the, the grantee institutions that gave them that technical assistance and that deeper understanding of best practices in emergency aid. And what we heard consistently from our grantees was that that alone, in a, you know, with or without the resources, was of great value to them. Of course, the resources were valuable as well. Uh, but the webinars and the information that they were able to to uh, to learn from those webinars was really valuable to them, and also some additional one-on-one -on -one technical assistance for those institutions that that really did not have that capacity and those capabilities to distribute that aid. The other thing I would say, and, and to my point about flexible resources, um, obviously the CARES Act resources did a great amount of good for a, an enormous number of students, and. There were some of those indirect supports that the CARES Act dollars were not able to support. So, for example, if you're an institution that has a food pantry or you needed to buy mobile hotspots or Wi-Fi for students during the pandemic, these resources were available to them for those types of purposes as well. And we had a number of institutions that used them in that way to really, again, optimize the different types of resources that they had for emergency aid. And we really wanted to develop them in a flexible way because we recognize that the institutions are always going to be closer to the ground in understanding what their students' needs are and how best they could leverage those resources to that end. So I'm going to turn it back over to the chairman to wrap up. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, as you see, I'm blessed to have her to my right side. <laughs> uh, our whole board is, not just me. Uh, a couple of closing thoughts. Um, as we... As, as the work group developed what we would do going across the state on these listening sessions, one of the things that a couple of three of us that really emphasized is the need that this not be a listening session just for higher ed or public ed. We needed corporate taxes engaged in this. I mean, they, they're why we exist. And, and I am excited about how we got corporate taxes got involved and Darrell Heath was a big part of that, particularly in the Dallas area. Uh, we had Fred Heldenfels here locally, Fred in the Valley, uh, Chairman of the Valley. And, and uh, uh, again, I want to emphasize the, uh, the Commissioner and, and, and uh, Melissa both uh, uh, committed to being sure that those engagements and, uh, continue. One of the things that we're emphasizing as a foundation, if you note the, the significant amount of monies raised, uh, even just in these last couple of years, has been to private from private foundations. We believe corporate Texas needs to step up. They all have foundations. Uh, they all support workforce. We're part of that workforce uh, solution. And uh, Daryl, he's leading a sub subcommittee right now because of his relationship in Dallas with a number of the Fortune 500 companies. There will be a big emphasis moving forward, uh, uh, Vice Chairman Williams and and. and, and Member Wilson on, on this board to open those doors. And all that is is about somebody having a relationship that has credibility that can open that door in order to make that ask. The, the, the great thing about what we have now that we haven't had in the past, and I think we, one of the reasons we've raised significant funds over the last two years, is we have specific areas targeted. Uh, these worksheets, uh, workflow uh, uh, initiatives, uh, people can identify. It's something that's going to make a difference, and they're willing to give money to that. And I think uh, the commissioner and I have talked about this, Melissa and I have talked about this, the board has. We're going to continue to expand that to meet those needs and where we can give donors specific, targeted, uh, 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 well-thought-out uh, initiatives that they can wrap their money around and make a difference for kids in this state and this future of this state. This quote, I don't know who's it attributed to. Uh, uh, Melissa and I don't know who it's attributed to, but it's a good quote because it really, I think, uh, defines who we are and what you are, and that higher education is vitally important for economic prosperity in Texas. 
As our economy endures rapid transformation, as it did during this pandemic, Texas Higher Ed will lead the way in expanding opportunity for individual Texans and their communities, accelerating economic recovery, and ensuring our state a competitive advantage. Uh, those are great words. We just need to put actions with them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I thank you for the opportunity to be here to make the the annual report on the foundation. Uh, we, as a foundation, appreciate the opportunity to be at the table, uh, and we look forward to continue to work with you to make a difference. And well, I'd thank, be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Adams. We uh, appreciate uh, you being here as well. Um, any comments or questions? Yeah, I do. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> having worked with Mr. Adams previously on several things, uh, I want to thank you, Neil. I think you're uniquely positioned with your experience to lead this effort, and I think we all appreciate that. Having said that, <clears throat> my there, question There's always a second part of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, eight million bucks is a good start. I agree. How do we move from eight to eighty and from eighty to eight hundred? I think we have to I think we we've got a good start to do that, having done that in just two years and only raised twenty six millions over ten uh, over twenty years. And I think we need to look at what we've done these past two years and improve that. And uh, again, it comes back to having specific initiatives coming out of, of the commissioner's office and this board and saying, hey, we need resources. State, state funding's not going to get it. We, got, we need resources over and above that. And uh, we've got to do and that. That's one reason I particularly have pushed for expanding this foundation board, because everybody that comes on this board has relationships, and that's what we're trying to take advantage of across Texas and across America. And that, that, that includes the, uh, this, this board as well. Uh, even though you don't sit on the foundation board, Mr. Torn, you can open doors, and I know you can. You have lots of doors that can be open. And, and, and so I think we're all part of that solution and part of that. Uh, being a, I agree. It needs to be $80 million. It doesn't need to be eight. Yeah, but that's a great start, though, comparing the figures when you look at those dates. and yeah. it, the, It's great It's job. there. The money's out there. I, I'll give you a short example. I recently had the privilege uh, to co-chair uh, a fundraising effort for the Tarrant County Bar Foundation in Fort Worth, Texas, Fort Worth, Tarrant County, Texas. And what I didn't realize is just in Tar Fort Worth, Texas alone, there's over 50 private foundations. You hear about the big ones from time to time. But you don't hear about the others that are sitting there, and every one of them, part of their purpose and mission is to support public ed or higher ed or both. And that's what we—that's another thing we need to identify where those resources are, and and we're going to hopefully do a better job of that. Thanks for the question and the comment. Yeah, I follow up. If I donate as a foundation, if I donate a couple of million bucks, why are you stopping it too? Just <laughs> okay. use whatever number you want. Okay. Do I am I kept abreast of the outcome, the result of my donations? So Absolutely. That I can see Absolutely. The efficiency of it? Absolutely. How? Uh, we are actually creating a newsletter that's going to actually uh, go out to our current donors, uh, and uh, and it, hopefully that's going to be I think a quarterly. Uh, we're, we're trying to create new ways to communicate, but. Uh, uh, if somebody made it, for instance, in these grants, they all have a reporting requirement. Well, I think the gift agreement, we've not had a, a large gift from an individual like that, uh, but all of these have gift agreements or grant agreements, and they do have specific reporting requirements and accountability. And uh, I would expect the same if we had an individual that was going to make that kind of uh, donation. I'll be happy to talk to you and Susan about that. <laughs> and, and if I could just build on that quickly. So in addition to the reporting requirements of the grant, uh, we also work really closely to stay in close communication with our funders. So whether that is monthly check-in calls with certain funders or the reporting requirements or check-in documents, um, we, we work to stay in close partnership. I would also say we uh, convene a group on a quarterly basis made up of state and national funders, not, not whether they are current funders or not, just to continue that ongoing dialogue with philanthropy and both in a two-way dialogue. Um, so both us sharing with them, here are the strategic priorities that we're working on to create those opportunities for alignment and to learn from other areas that they're funding across the state and across the country so that we are, we are keeping a close touch with and a pulse on where those, where those opportunities are. 
great. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Wilson? Uh, no, no, I would just oh, I thought got a comment to Neil, and so he's your he's your good friend, and he's throwing out these kind of questions. Is that? <laughs> That's the kind of friend he is. <laughs> <laughs> if I hearing, oh, did you want to comment? If, if I could just make one uh, final comment, uh, also just to highlight that this is a unique asset. So uh, my um, uh, my colleagues across the country, similar uh, coordinating boards, governing boards, uh, it, it, it's rare that you have a, a foundation. Uh, partner, and it's it's hard to overstate the importance of that, especially this last um, year and a half for helping us move faster, helping us uh, focus the public dollars uh, more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, there are a number of examples of that, as uh, Melissa described. Um, we're more than a year ahead of where I might have hoped to be around the data modernization uh, initiative in particular because of that close partnership with the foundation. So I'm deeply grateful uh, to Neil and to the uh, foundation board and uh, to our funders uh, for helping us uh, move faster and more effectively. So Mr. Chairman, I might mention one example uh, of something that really resonates with me is Advise Texas uh, when that came from North Carolina and uh, to help kids and their parents understand that they can go to college, it, it can be financed, it can be uh, affordable. Uh, what and, and back to Sam's question, it's not just philanthropy. That initial initiative that we funded as a foundation uh, will have philanthropic money is now a four million dollar a year appropriation or uh, per per biennium appropriation. So it can lead also to led, uh, to some appropriations if we can. Mm -hmm. it, it comes back to accountability and, and making a difference and being accountable. Uh, and those kind of things, and the legislature seen fit to, to, to up that ante, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited about what that does for families and kids that don't have that kind of advice. So, right, and, and Neil, you brought up a great point. It's about the it's about the kids, the students, and the initiatives to be able to provide. So we do, as the commissioner said, really appreciate the, the first of all the leadership that you and all the members of the uh, foundation. Um, just looking at that room, and you look at that list, and we're going like, there's a lot of great uh, historical. A passion and knowledge about higher education is just being around the group is just uh, it's just great so I and I appreciate everyone continuing to be involved you, you read the list of past board members chairman and currently or past chairs of board of regents or trustees uh, it's it's really impressive uh, and the hard work that you've put in so we appreciate your leadership and, you. and Melissa you've also taken it to a new level so thank you for the partnership with the coordinating board uh, we, we have priorities. The commissioner and I discuss this often, and we appreciate having those resources. Um, one, one last thing, Mr. Chairman. It, it reminded me when you talked about relationships. Uh, the chair and I are working on a dinner uh, one, uh, that uh, we were not able to do during pandemic. In the past, we were able to get this board and our board to uh, and their spouses together. I think that's important that we get to know each other better. Uh, that helps us be better board members in both cases, and so we're shooting, I think, for January to try to do that, and so we'll look forward to seeing each of you there. And again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Okay. Thank you all. You thank, thank you, you Chairman. Okay, I'd like the minutes to re to reflect that uh, Mr. Sam Torn is here, and we will move on to agenda item 6B. And that is the acceptance of gifts and donations to the board. Members, the gifts and donations are listed in your materials. Nicole Bunker Henderson, our general counsel, is available for questions. Members, do you have any questions? Hearing none, do I have a motion for approval to accept the gifts and donations as listed? So moved. A motion by Ms. Schwartz. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Torn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you. We move on to agenda item 6C, which is an update on Texas transfer initiatives. Ray Martinez, Deputy Commissioner of Academic Affairs well, work and Workforce Education, uh, and Dr. Stacy Silverman, Assistant Commissioner for Academic and Health Affairs, will be available for questions. Deputy Commissioner Martinez. Good morning, Mr. Chairman uh, and members. Uh, good to see everybody this morning. As Commissioner Keller mentioned yesterday during our uh, committee meetings, uh, the issue of transfer is now essentially a standing item for this board so that we can come before you uh, and give you an update on the various 
initiatives that we are currently implementing to help improve transfer, uh, particularly transfer between our uh, community colleges uh, and our public four-year institutions. And we have a lot of initiatives going on under Commissioner Keller's uh, leadership, including implementation of SB 25, which was important transfer legislation passed by the Texas legislature in the 2019 legislative session. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Stacy Silverman. Uh, she and her team are very capably leading uh, uh, the various initiatives that we're doing, and she'll give you some additional detail, and we're happy to answer any questions. Stacy. Thank you, Ray, and good morning, uh, Chairman Farias and members of the board. It's a pleasure to see everyone this morning. Um, and as uh, Ray mentioned, transfer continues to be a priority for the agency, for the commissioner, and for the board. Um, today I'll pro provide you with a quick overview about how we're meeting SB 25 obligations, the work of the Texas Transfer Advisory Committees, Subcommittees on Criminal Justice, and Business Administration. And again, I'm going to highlight now for the third time a new GEAR-funded grant opportunity to help support institutional efforts to offer students access to high-value high skills that will help students enter the workforce prepared to contribute at their highest level. So Senate Bill 25, or the transfer legislation passed by the 86th Te Texas Legislature, included many initiatives. The institutional reporting of recommended course sequencing is underway, and to date we have several institutions submitting data, and 14 have finalized their data submissions. The deadline for institutions to report is December 1st, and just as a reminder, this data collection effort will help students, researchers, and mostly, most importantly, students uh, to provide real-time information about undergraduate programs which offer everyone information about the best way for students to progress through their desired degree program. A quick update on the work of the Texas Transfer Advisory Committee's subcommittees. As you all may recall, the Texas Transfer Advisory Committee called for the creation of two subcommittees to develop a new recommended Texas transfer field of study. I'm pleased to report that the Subcommittee on Criminal Justice met over a two-day period in late September and successfully developed a recommendation that will be transmitted to the Texas uh, Transfer Advisory Committee at their next meeting. Um, this will include a recommendation of courses to include in that new Texas Transfer Field of Study for Criminal Justice. I'd like to extend my appreciation for all the members of the subcommittee and for their hard work. Um, the Subcommittee on Business Administration will meet next week on October 26th and 27th. Finally, the next TTAC meeting uh, is scheduled for November 10th. At that meeting, the TTAC will consider the recommendations from the Criminal Justice Subcommittee, and if the Subcommittee on Business Administration is successful, which I'm hopeful it will be, uh, will also forward their recommendation to the TTAC. Uh, I'm also pleased to let you know that by December 2022, we'll run 10 disciplines through the new Texas Transfer Framework. Um, and some, I'm just going to highlight again, this will be the third time we've heard this this morning, be first from the Commissioner and last from Melissa, the accelerating credentials of purpose and value requests for applications will be posted very soon. Um, it is going to support two-year, four-year, and health-related public institutions of a higher education. Selected applications will receive funding to support the development and or expansion of embedded credentials into existing or developing new curriculum to ensure that students gain valuable skills while pursuing their degree programs. The funding will support efforts at the undergraduate and graduate levels. Specifically, the new grant program will develop or expand the short-term industry-recognized credentials from three fields, digital skills, including programming, web applications and development, digital project management and cybersecurity programs, data analytics, including data analytics and visualization, and third, frontline healthcare programs, including nursing, medical specialists, and technical technician programs. 
Um, we're going to be hosting a webinar, hopefully on Monday, October 25th, to provide potential applicants with information about the program. The application will be up very soon, and we expect awards will be made in November. That concludes in late November. That concludes my remarks, and I'm happy to address any questions you all may have. Thank you. Hearing none, uh, no questions from the board, we will move on to the next item. Okay, agenda item 6E is consideration and possible action to prove the memorandum of understanding between the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board and the Texas Higher Education Foundation to implement General Appropriations Act Rider 53. Melissa Henderson, Executive Director of the Texas Higher Education Foundation, will present this item and be available for questions. Nicole Bunker Henderson, General Counsel, is also available for questions. Ms. Henderson. Hello again. Thank you, Chairman and members. As you know, Texas Encore is transferred from UT Austin to the Coordinating Board earlier this year. This transfer was codified in House 27 from the 87th regular legislative session, and the associated general revenue was also moved into the Coordinating Board's portion of the General Appropriations Act. Additionally, Rider 53 in the General Appropriations Act authorized the Board to contract with the Foundation to commercialize the Texas Encore's products and tools. For example, Texas Encore currently has a licensing agreement in place with states of Delaware and Michigan for them to have access to the suite of counselor and advisor tools and trainings available via the Encore Academy. We have drafted a proposed MOU between the Coordinating Board and the Foundation to provide this contract commercialization, which is in your board material, and which was approved by the Foundation Board on Tuesday. We're asking the Board to approve the MOU with the Tech Higher Education Foundation. Thank you, Chairman, and I'll be happy to Thank you, Ms. Henderson. Uh, first, do we have any questions on this topic? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between Texas Education Coordinating Board and the Texas Higher Education Foundation? Motion by Ms. Williams. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Torn. Any discussion? Not members. In favor, please stand by by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Say no. Hearing the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, back to uh, agenda item 6D is the Star Awards program. Uh, Ray Martinez, Deputy Commissioner of Public Affairs and Workforce Education, and Dr. Ginger Goldman, Senior Director, will provide us over to you and be able to answer questions. Deputy Commissioner Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening again. You'll hear this presentation from my colleague, Dr. Ginger Austin, an overview of the Star Wars. I think I would just preface it by I'm turning things over to Ginger, but I would say that um, the, uh, I think everybody is familiar with the Star Wars. It's the opportunity for the decisions to recognize what we know is excellence out at our institutions of higher education that go on in many different facets. Uh, for this past year, what we sought to do, given the impact of the health pandemic on all of our lives, but uh, especially with our focus on higher education, what we, what we asked for institutions to do is to uh, nominate or have nominations where the focus of the applications would be how did the institution respond with their campus community and probably in, and as well with the broader uh, local community to respond to uh, the, the very uh, changes that occurred as a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. And we, we ended up receiving a high number of applications. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet that we have to award some way to acknowledge some canting off of all the applications because everybody, all the institutions that submitted applications are deserving uh, of recognition. Uh, in keeping with Star Wars, the Star Wars we want to go to this presentation with real quick and then tell you uh, which institutions have been selected for Star Wars in the current calendar. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Inez, and good morning, Chairman. Um, thank you for your time today. Again, my name is Jane Gossman, and I work for Ray. <laughs> so I'm going to provide a brief review of the Star Wars program and then a next 21 review. Presentation. Be sure this 
invite you in coming on this debris reminder that the start began in 2001. And that the 2021 program is the 20th We'll be recognizing our institution's certification for during the pandemic is pretty great for 20 years of the story. Applications brief and with the cruise sheet and up to four pages of narrative. Prior iterations of Star Wars 2020 program was limited to one application per institution. The website announcement and the gut liver email research uh, detailed the application process, including the most important criteria. Uh, we were pleased that we received 30 celebrations. Um, each sector was represented in the applicant pool. 17 staff reviewed all applications in September. Those reviews informed the recommendations that could be given to each one. I thank you to my colleagues who took on this major responsibility. In addition to recognize recipients at this meeting, all sides to share their response efforts on the day of the Leaflet Conference. The top criteria of this is your list of applications which information of the institution response to code. The criteria were a clear demonstration of how the institution implemented strategies to ensure the health, safety, and success, including students of their campus and local community. Second, clear and straight partnerships with community based organizations, including public health or non profit organizations. Finally, the innovative and creative nature of one or more of the strategies. These are some applications and applications. There aren't any order, but they really set up the path that I'm going to share them with you. Our next recipients here are the University of Texas at Arlington, Houston Community College, Texas A&M University of Commerce, the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, Dessa College, the University of Texas at Tyler, McLennan Community College, Sam Houston State University, Texas State Technical College, and Lone Star College in North Harris. Now, I know we have a poll out today, but let's give a round of applause for 2021 recipients. <laughs> we just congratulate congratulate you all to each of these institutions and encourage them. Today. So I'm really glad we're still back to this agenda item. <laughs> this agenda recipients are invited to your reception at Leaders Conference in early December. And they are invited to um, share what their response efforts were in a poster presentation during our reception. In addition, um, a plaque listing the 2020 recipients will join the back of the recipients here at the courtroom board outside the boardroom in the hallway. And the recipients will also receive a certificate and award. So I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Dr. Oz, we have a, a technical issue with the uh, audio. So we're going to take oh. a little pause here because okay. a lot of people listening in for this presentation to find out because this is the official, official announcement for the first time. Indeed. We're going to take a little break. Technical difficulties. So okay. Thank you all. Everyone get ready to clap in. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The executive session has concluded. No action was taken during executive session. The time right now is 1.13 p.m. The board is now reconvened in regular session. Is there a motion on the evaluations? I move we approve the evaluations of the general counsel, auditor, and commissioner and delegate to the chair, the deputy, to finalize the evaluations and sign the evaluations on behalf of the board. Thank second. you. I have a motion by Ms. Williams. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Clemens. Okay. Thank you. Clemmer. Uh, any further discussion, members? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Thank you. We will now return to agenda, agenda item 6D, which was interrupted due to technical difficulties. 
<laughs> Agenda item 6D is the Star Award program. Ray Martinez, Deputy Commissioner for Academic Affairs and Workforce Education, and along with Dr. Ginger Gosman, Senior Director, will provide this overview and will be available to answer questions. Deputy Commissioner Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Farias, appreciate you uh, giving us an opportunity to uh, tout the excellent work of uh, our institutions of higher education across the state, uh, and that is what the Star Awards are intended to do. I will turn things over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Ginger Gossman, uh, to explain how we are awarding the Star Awards for 2021, a slightly unusual year for Star Awards because of the global health pandemic and our efforts now to recognize institutions across the state who have done uh, exemplary work uh, in, uh, in, in serving both their campus communities and also their local and regional communities in responding uh, to this global health pandemic. So I'll turn it over to Ginger. Yes, thank you and good afternoon. Um, very happy to have this opportunity to show our appreciation for the, the field and the work that they're doing, the commitment they're showing to their campus communities and to their students, particularly to uh, continued student success. Um, this is the 20th anniversary of the Star Awards program. Um, we had a great response from the field, uh, 31 applications showing the work that they've done in response to COVID-19 during this pandemic. And without further ado, these are our recipients for 2021. University of Texas at Arlington, Houston Community College, Texas A&M University Commerce, University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, Odessa College, University of Texas at Tyler, McLennan Community College, Sam Houston State University, Texas State Technical College, and Lone Star College, North Harris. So uh, once again, let's have a round of applause for our winners. <laughs> We did invite the, these institutions to tune in today, so very glad to have this opportunity to share the list with you. Um, as mentioned uh, earlier in the day, the recipients will receive an award or certificate. They are invited to the leadership conference this year where we're hosting a reception the first day, and they're going to be uh, invited to share poster sessions or posters of the work they've done during the, the pandemic. Um, I, at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, and invite uh, the chairman and the commissioner to share any information they have about the start words. Okay. Commissioner, would you like to say a few words? Uh, just very briefly, um, I, I wanted to echo uh, one of uh, the, the points that Deputy Commissioner Martinez made, that we had some um, uh, excellent and heroic efforts from our institutions to support uh, their students the faculty, their staff, and also the broader community health uh, responses uh, during the, the pandemic. So uh, it's, uh, it was not an easy process, I know, uh, for folks to, to narrow down to uh, uh, select these 10 institutions, but we're delighted to showcase as, as just a sample of the excellent work that our institutions have done on uh, behalf of their, uh, their campuses and their communities. And I would like to echo that as well. Uh, having served before uh, on the selection committee and understanding the, the complexities of making key decisions like that, uh, I want to thank all of the, the, uh, the, the institutions and people that submitted applications. There were a lot of great applications. I get a, get a chance to see uh, those and review those. And I think the staff, uh, Ray, did a great job uh, in the selection. It's always tough when you have so many good, good uh, proposals, let's say. Um, and, but I want to thank everyone for being engaged, uh, participating, applying, and look forward to uh, recognizing at the Leadership Council uh, those that have been selected. So uh, it's a great uh, um, presentation uh, at the event. It's one of my favorite parts of the Leadership Council, other than the Commissioner's update on higher education, of course. <laughs> but um, it's, a, it's a great to, uh, to honor and uh, recognize great work that our institutions are doing. So thank you for this report. Okay, um, if there's no other comments on that, on the Star Awards, we'll move on. Agenda item 6E was already heard earlier in the agenda. Agenda item 6F was approved on consent. Uh, agenda item uh, 7 would be next. And that is matters relating to the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. <coughs> this is chaired by uh, 
uh, Mr. Javed Anwar, but uh, the report will be given today by Vice Chairman Mr. Wilson, who will provide today's update. Mr. Wilson. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, agenda items um, 7A is, is committee chair's meeting overview, and thank you for <clears throat> joining us in the matters relating to the Committee on Innovation Data and Educational Analytics. Unfortunately, Mr. Anwar was unable to be here today, so I will report on the uh, idea items uh, in his stead. Agenda items 7B through 7F1 uh, were approved on the consent calendar uh, today. So, Mr. Chairman, this concludes our portion of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Our next item on our agenda is lunch, but we combined already lunch with our executive session earlier in the agenda, so we will move on to agenda item nine, which is matters relating to the Committee on Academic and Workforce Success, chaired by Vice Chair Donna Williams. Ms. Good Williams. Af good afternoon. During the Committee on Academic Workforce and Success meeting yesterday, the committee approved the following items. Minutes from April 21st, 2020 cause meeting, the report on school closures and teach outs, a request from Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine for a second certificate of authority to grant degrees in Texas, the Texas General Academic Institutions Increasing Success Community College Transfer Report, the report on effectiveness of the Advised Text Program, Advised Texas Program, a request from Texas A&M University for a doctorate of nursing degree with a major in nursing practice, a request from Texas State University for a bachelor's of science in mechanical engineering, a request from Texas Tech University Health Science Center for a doctor of science in rehabilitation sciences, a request from Texas Women's University for a Doctor of Philosophy in Education, Leadership, and Organization, the amendments to the Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 4, Subchapter A, Rule 4.8 of Board Rules, amendments to Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 4, Subchapter A, Section 4.9 of Board Rules, Amendments to Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 4, Subchapter D, Section 4.84 of Board Rules, Repeal of Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 5, Subchapter C, Section 5.51 of Board Rules, Amendments to Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 7, Subchapter A, Section 7.7 .7 and 7.8 of Board Rules, and Administrative, and, excuse me, Amendments to Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 9, Subchapter N, Section 9.673 of Board Rules. The committee also received a report on activities of Applied Texas Advisory Committee and a report on the activities of the Advisory Council Post-Secondary Education for Persons with Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. Agenda Item 9B is the Constitution of Adopting the Certification Advisory Council's recommendation relating to the request from Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine for a second certificate of authority to grant degrees in Texas. Dr. Tina Jackson, Assistant Commissioner for Workforce Education, will present this item and be available to answer any questions. Dr. Jackson. Hello. Hello, Chair and Board Members. Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine is seeking a second certificate of authority for its regional education center in El Paso, out of which it coordinates clinical clerkships rotations in the El Paso metropolitan area. Burrell's Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree has programmatic 
accreditation by the American Osteopathic Association's Commission on Osteopathic College Accreditation. It is working towards institutional accreditation by the Higher Learning Commission. The first certificate of authority for Burrell was approved by the board in 2019. Prior to the board issuing the first certificate of authority, Burrell entered into a memorandum of understanding with Texas Tech University Health Science Center in El Paso as to the scope of its operations in Texas. As part of the review process, Burrell El Paso's hospital training partners confirmed there were adequate clinical faculty available and sufficient to train both Burrell and Texas Tech students training in the El Paso area. The MOU is re remains still in place. The second certificate of authority will be valid from December 2021 through December 2023. The Certification Advisory Council has recommended approval. The board will also be considering adopting rules to implement changes to requirements for for both Certificate of Authority and Certificate of Authorization. These changes were made via Senate Bill 1490 in the 87th Texas Legislature Session. Senate Bill 1490 requires applicants for Certificate of Authority to provide information regarding capacity and market needs, faculty resources, meeting standards for professional degrees, and sufficient placement for field-based learning. The site team visit for the second Certificate of Authority found Burrell had met all requirements and standards for operation. As a part of the review, the process for the second Certificate of Authorization, Burrell's El Paso Hospital training partners once again confirmed they, were, they had an abundance of clinical faculty available to suffice to train both Burrell and te Texas Tech students in the El Paso area. And this concludes my report. Thank you. Members, any questions for Dr. Jackson? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion? I'll move. It's been moved. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Before we move to agenda item 9C, uh, I have one correction on the, uh, when I made my announcements a few minutes ago, I said uh, we were, we approved the minutes from the April 22nd uh, uh, board meeting. It was the July 21st, 2020 cause meeting. So just let the records reflect this July as opposed to April. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item 9C was approved on consent. Agenda item 9D is consideration of adopting the Texas General Academic Institution Increasing Community College Transfer Report, General Appropriations Act, Senate Bill 1, Article 3, Section 47, 87th Texas Legislature Regular Session. Dr. Stacy Silverman, Assistant Commissioner for Academic and Health Affairs, will present this item and be available for questions. Dr. Silverman. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams, and um, good afternoon, everyone. I will be brief. Uh, the General Appropriations Act directs the public universities to submit an annual report to the Coordinating Board that details institutional efforts to increase the number, persistence, and success of community college transfer students. The legislative directive requires the Coordinating Board to collect and analyze institutional reports and performance data. This report summarizes the actions taken by the public universities over the past year to increase the number, persistence, and success of community college transfer students. The report also includes staff analysis of the institutional responses and institutional data from the Coordinating Board Management Reports. This is the 11th such report, and it is due to the legislature by November 1st. The recommendation is for approval. Thank you. Any questions? Hearing none, do I have a motion to adopt the Texas General Academic Institution Increasing Successful Community College Transfer, Transfer Report, General Appropriations Act, Senate Bill 1, Article 3, Section 47, 87th Texas Legislature Regular Session? May I have a motion? So moved. Have a motion. May I have a second? 
been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item 9E, 9F, and 9G was approved on the consent agenda. Agenda item 9H is consideration of approving the following request for a new degree programs. Agenda item 9H1 is consideration of approving the request from Texas A&M University for a doctor of nursing degree with a major in nursing practice. Dr. Nancy Farrenwall, Dean Professor, Dean and Professor, College of Nursing, Dr. Matthew Sorensen, Professor and PhD Program Coordinator are available for questions and comments. Dr. Stacy Silverman will present this and be available to answer questions. Dr. Silverman. Hey, Your mic is not on. Sorry. Did you, can you all hear? Nah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, A&M University is seeking approval to offer a Doctor of Nursing Practice degree program. The proposed online post-master's program would require 38 semester credit hours and would begin in fall 2022. The proposed program would prepare advanced practice nurses to become clinical leaders who are skilled in the translation of evidence into clinical practice. The institution will seek accreditation for the DNP program from the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, and the institution estimates that five-year costs would total just over $4 million. The, recommend the recommendation is approval, and we do have institutional representatives here to address any questions. Dr. Fernwall, would you like to make comments? Thank you. The Doctor of Nursing Practice Program is the movement in nursing for the practice doctorate. The practice doctorate is common in other disciplines, such as the doctor of physical therapy, the doctor of PT, when they transitioned from the master's entry. This is the entry level for advanced practice nursing projected for the future of nursing practice. Dr. Sorensen, would you like to make comments? I would just uh, endorse the comments by Dean Farrenwald in that considering the increasing requirements and knowledge base that people require for education at advanced practice level within nursing, that really a DNP is becoming more and more the expectation uh, in terms of people being able to develop the skills and demonstrate the expertise that's needed. Thank you. Thank you both for being here. Members, do you have any questions? No, I just wanted to comment that yesterday during the committee meeting, I appreciate both doc, uh, Dr. Farrenwald and Dr. Sorensen's comments about the shortages we have in nursing. We don't have to readdress that, but those that are watching uh, online, we did have a, a good, robust discussion about the shortages that we have in nursing and, and their, um, the concerns that we have as a state uh, for our citizens, and thank you for helping address it by bringing programs like this to us. All right. Move for approval. Thank you. I'll read the motion. I already have a move, and then I'll get a second. Do I have a motion to approve the request from the Texas A&M University for a Doctor of Nursing degree with a major in nursing practice? I have a motion made by Dr. Torn, and may I have a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item 9H2 is consideration of approving the request from Texas State University for a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Jean Bourgeois, President and President, and then also Dr. Jean Haley, Provost and Vice President for <laughs> Academic Affairs. Uh, Dr. Haley, Dean College of Science and Engineering. Dr. Jesus Jimenez, School Director of Ingram School of Engineering, are available for questions. Dr. Stacy Silverman will present the um, item, and then we'll move on to the uh, guests that we have that joined us. Dr. Thank Silverman. you, Vice Chair Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, Texas State University is seeking approval to offer a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. If approved, the pro proposed face-to-face -face program would prepare students for careers 
with a strong foundation in traditional mechanical engineering principles combined with an education in designing and developing mechanical systems that are intelligent, interconnected, and integrated with the virtual world and emerging digital infrastructure known as Industry 4.0 Tools and Technologies. In accordance with the institution's proposed hiring schedule, Texas State will hire 11 core faculty members. Two new core faculty members would be hired in years one and two of the program. Four new core faculty members would be hired in year three of the program. Three new core faculty would be hired in the fourth year of the program. The institution estimates that five-year costs would total just under $12.5 million, and the recommendation is approval, and we do have representatives available virtually to address any questions. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Dean Bourgeois, would you like to make comments? Yes. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. Well, as, as you and your colleagues on cause yesterday heard from President Trout, I'll be brief. Uh, she and my colleagues indicated that Texas State University is ready to step up to the plate to offer this new Industry 4.0 Mechanical Engineering degree program. We feel it will significantly help address significant workforce needs, not only here in Central Texas, but throughout Texas. So I thank you for allowing us to put this proposition before you. Thank you. Dr. Haley, would you like to make comments? I'll just simply add, I very much concur with what Provost Bourgeois said. I really believe that we will prepare leaders who can meet both the current workforce needs in engineering as well as future workforce needs in Texas. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Menez. Thank you. Um, I quickly add that I endorse the comments by uh, Provost Bourgeois and Dean Haley. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions? I have a, a comment, if I could, please. Sure. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Industry 4.0 is clearly an emerging area that's uh, going to represent a significant opportunity for future employment and have a significant impact on the way uh, companies do their business and, and how they can perform better. I do think that it requires um, relationships across m multiple disciplines, not just in mechanical engineering. So I would encourage you to think about how you bring that together with electrical engineering and, and IT and other areas so that you can have a forward-looking program that really can add a significant amount of value in trying to address Industry 4.0. And there's a lot of areas around the world that you can uh, look at some of the best practices to see how to really move forward with that. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the request from Texas State University for a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering? I'll make a motion. So moved. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Agenda item 9H3 is consideration of approving the request from Texas Tech University Health Science Center for a Doctor of Science in Rehabilitation Sciences, Dr. Carrie Dickerson, Vice Provost, and Higher Ed Coordinating Board SACS COC Liaison, Dr. Stephen Sawyer, PT, Executive Associate Dean, Chair Department of Rehabilitation Sciences, and Dr. Brad Pitt Allen, PT, Program Director, are available for questions and comments. Dr. Stacy Silverman will present the item and is available for questions and comments as well. Dr. Silverman. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. Uh, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center is seeking approval to offer a Doctor of Science degree program in Rehabilitation Sciences to be delivered primarily online in a hybrid format. The proposed program would offer students the option of two tracks, clinical research or clinical education. Both tracks would require students to complete dissertations. Currently, there are no bachelor's, master's, or doctoral uh, level rehabilitation science programs in Texas. Uh, that fall within this SIP code. In accordance with the institution's proposed hiring schedule, Texas Tech Health Sciences Center 
will hire two additional core faculty members in years three and five. The institution estimates that five-year costs would total just over $3.27 million, and the re recommendation is for approval. And again, we have institutional representatives available virtually to address any of your questions. Thank you. Dr. Dickerson, would you like to make comments? Yes, good afternoon. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to speak on behalf of Drs. Allen and Sawyer as well. Uh, we just want to express appreciation on the part of TTUHSC, thanking the board for your consideration of the proposed program. And I'd also like to express our appreciation to the coordinating board staff who always help us navigate these approval processes. They're always great to work with. So we, we definitely approve your consideration of this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Members, do you have any questions? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the request from Texas Tech University Health Science Center for a Doctor of Science in Rehabilitation Services? May I have a motion? I'll move. It's been moved. May I have a second? Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Agenda item 9H is consideration of approving the request from Texas Women's University for a Doctor of Philosophy in Education, Leadership, and Organization. Dr. Sharon L. Nichols, Professor and Chair. Dr. Jeremy Sullivan, Professor, and Dr. Victor Verriel, Associate Professor, are available for questions and comments. Dr. Stacy Silverman will present this item as well and be available for questions. Dr. Silverman. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. Texas Women's University is seeking approval to offer a Doctor of Philosophy degree in education, leadership, and organization. The proposed program would prepare students for educational leadership roles in early childhood through 12th grade, higher education, and interdisciplinary nonprofit settings. The anticipated start date would be January 2022. The proposed fully online program would require a minimum of 75 semester credit hours post master's degree. Most students entering the program would be full-time practicing educators and enroll in the program part-time. In Texas, there are currently 30 public and independent institutions with doctoral programs in the same CIP code, which is administration and leadership. There are four programs in educational leadership within 60 miles of Denton. However, the institution has made the case that they have a population that they would serve that would be different uh, and they would be able to actually do a service statewide. The institution estimates that five-year costs would total just over $2.2 million and the recommendation is approval and we do have institutional representatives available virtually to address your questions. Thank you. Institutions, Dr. Nichols, would you like to make comments? I think you might have the wrong person. Um, this is this is Carolyn Capinas. I'm the provost at Texas Women's University. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I have the wrong I have the wrong list of folks. Yes, that that's You're quite all right. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll keep my comments brief and I'll, I'll speak for our, our other institutional uh, representatives here. Thank you very much for your consideration of this degree. And I want to thank members of the coordinating board for their help as we navigate through this process. Leadership is a central part of our institution as reflected by the Jane Nelson Institute for Women's Leadership. And we are very excited about the prospect of adding this degree to our portfolio. The interdisciplinary nonprofit track in our program sets it apart from other doctoral programs in educational leadership. And as Dr. Silverman noted, this, this degree will be offered in an online format. And that's important because it will allow us to expand our reach to place bound students and busy professionals. I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I found my notes from yesterday. Dr. Holly Henson-Thomas, are you on? Yes, <laughs> you're welcome to make comments. 
I am. I, I, I will echo the comments uh, made by my provost and um, we just very much appreciate the opportunity to be here today and to present our proposed program. All right, thank you. Thank you. I see a couple other representatives on the call. Would you guys like to make comments? Okay. You're here for moral support. All right. Thank you. <laughs> uh, members, do you have any questions or any comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the request from Texas Uni Women's University for a Doctor of Philosophy in Education Leadership and Organization? May I have a motion? Almost. I have a motion. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion, further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Agenda item 9H5 is consideration of approving the University of Texas at San Antonio for a Doctor of Philosophy in Education, Leadership, and Organization. Dr. Sharon L. Nichols, Professor and Chair. Dr. Jeremy Sullivan, Professor, and Dr. Victor Viriel, the ones that I said a few minutes ago. This is actually their, excuse me, School of Psychology. Sorry about that. I have it. No, I have a doctor of philosophy. Okay. All righty. I read it. I, my notes have a, a misprint in here. But Dr. Stacy Silverman will present will present <laughs> will present the item and then we have representatives on the call as well. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. Mm -hmm. The University of Texas at San Antonio is seeking approval to offer a Doctor of Philosophy degree in school psychology. The proposed face-to-face -face program would prepare graduates for careers as licensed psychologists. If approved, UT San Antonio will seek accreditation from the National Association of School Psychologists and the American Psychological Association. The proposed PhD program would consist of a minimum of 54 semester credit hours for students entering with a master's degree and 87 semester credit hours for students entering with a bachelor's degree. The, the curriculum would adhere to the APA requirements, which includes practicum hours and a dissertation. In accordance with the institution's proposed hiring schedule, UT San Antonio will hire two core faculty members. One additional core faculty member would be hired in the first year, and one would be hired in the second year of the program. The institution estimates that five-year costs would total just over $4 million, and the recommendation is approval, and we do have institutional representatives available virtually to address any of your questions. Thank you. Institutions, would you guys like to represent? Sure, I'll just make a quick comment. I'm Dr. Sharon Nichols. I'm the chair of the Department of Educational Psychology in which the program in school psychology, PhD program is proposed to be housed. And I wanna echo what my colleagues have said, um, thanking the coordinating board and the help ushering through uh, this process. Um, it's been very helpful. Um, and we're excited to be the only PhD granting school psychology program in South Texas if, if approved. Um, providing the expertise and the personnel necessary to um, help with academic, mental, and social uh, and behavioral um, um, issues throughout our community with our, with our school po age population. So thank you very much. All right, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Hearing none, I will move on to the motion. Uh, let me see, may I have a motion for the consideration of approving the request from the University of Texas at San Antonio for a Doctor of Philosophy in the School of Psychology. May I have a motion? So moved. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. The motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes now. Congratulations. Thank you again. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Agenda item 9I was approved on consent. Agenda item 9J are rules portion of the agenda. 
agenda item 9J1 was approved on consent, as well as 9J2. Agenda item 9J3 is consideration of possible adoption of the opposed amendments proposed amendments to the Texas Administrative Code, Title 19, Part 1, Chapter 4, Subchapter D, Section 4.84 of Board Rules Concerning Institutional Agreements for Dual Credit Programs. Dr. Stacy Silverman will present this item as well. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. The proposed amendments are based on legislative changes made by Senate Bill 1277, which requires specific criteria be included in a dual credit agreement established between an institution of higher education and a school district. The proposed amendments require that a dual credit agreement designate at least one employee of the district or institution as responsible for academic advising to a student who enrolls in dual credit courses before the student Enroll, begins the course. The change should help ensure that students who enroll in dual credit courses take the classes that will help them in their future educational pursuits and will limit students taking courses that won't apply to their future degree paths. The recommendation is for approval and no comments were received on the proposed amendment. Members, do we have any questions or comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the adoption of the pro proposed amendments to the board rule 8.4 concerning institutional agreements for dual credit programs? May I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Williams, may I make a brief correction? It's sure. actually rule 4.84. 4.84. Yes, sorry about that. I think okay. we had just had a All right. typo Th there. All right, thank you. Thank you much. I have a motion. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. That correction. With that correction. Yes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item 9J4 was approved on consent. Agenda item 9J5 is consideration and possible adoption of proposed amendments to the Board Rule 7.7 .7 concerning institutions accredited by the Board's recognized accreditors and Rule 7.8 concerning institutions not accredited by a Board-recognized creditor, accreditor. Dr. Tina Jackson will present this item. Hello again, Chair and Board Members. Senate Bill 1490 requires applicants of Certificates of Authority to provide information regarding capacity and market needs, faculty and resources, meeting standards for professional degrees, and um, sufficient placement for field-based learning. For reference, these restrictions were contained in Senate Bill 1490 enacted by the 87th Texas Legislature. A certificate of authorization grants accredited degree granting post-secondary institutions or out-of-state public post-secondary institutions authorization to offer degrees and courses leading to degrees at Texas locations. A certificate of authority provides a guideline and timelines for application processes for institutions in seeking accreditation. An institution can hold a series of certificate of authorities for up to eight years as it seeks recognized accreditation. During that period of time, the coordinating board maintains oversight to ensure the institution meets standards for operation and is moving towards accreditation. The revisions serve two purposes. First, to add a restriction for authorizing professional degrees under Certificate of Authorization for, for accredited institutions and under Certificate of Authorities for institutions not yet accredited. Second, the revisions clarify or correct rule language and proce processes into the rules for review of applications and approval of institutional closures. 
We worked closely with our institutional partners to ensure the language included in Senate Bill 1490 addressed institutional and agency concerns around these types of certificates, while ensuring we met the requirements outlined in the State Authorization Roster Priority Agreement, or also known as SARA, under which Texas is a member state. This concludes my report. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Hearing none, do I have a motion to adopt the proposed amendment to Board Rule 7.7 .7 concerning institutions accredited by board recognized accreditors and Rule 7.8 .8 concerning institutions not accredited by a board recognizing, recognized accreditor? May I have a motion? So moved. May I have a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Agenda item 9J6 is consideration and possible adoption of proposed amendments to board rule 96. 73 concerning baccalaureate degree programs at public junior colleges. Dr. Stacy Silverman will present this item. Thank you, Vice Chair Williams. The proposed amendments are a result of the passage of House Bills 3348 and 885, which will allow public junior colleges to apply for coordinating board approval to offer bachelor's degree programs if the college district has a taxable property valuation of at least $4 billion in the previous year, and there are, not, there are no four-year institutions of higher in education within the same county. It also increases the number of bachelor's completion programs that public junior colleges may offer from three to five for all junior colleges. And no comments were received on the proposed amendments, and the uh, motion is for approval, or the recommendation is for approval. Thank you. There. <laughs> Thank you. Any comments? Any questions? Okay, hearing none, do I have a motion to adopt the proposed amendments to Board Rule 9673 of Board Rules concerning baccalaureate degree programs at public junior colleges? May I have a motion? So moved. I have a motion. May I have a second? been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes. This concludes the Committee on Workforce and Success Agenda. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Next on agenda item 10 is matters relating to the Agency Operations Committee, and the report will be by Ms. Uh, Schwartz. Good afternoon. During the Agency Operations Committee yesterday, the committee approved the following items. Minutes from the July 21, 2021 Agency Operations Committee meeting, a resolution authorizing the issuance of Texas college student loan bonds in one or more series, and delegation of the authority for administration and approval of these activities necessary to complete the sale of the private activity bonds. The committee also received a report on grants and contracts, a review of the fiscal year 2021 financial report, an update on internal audit reports and activities, and an update on state and federal compliance monitoring reports and activities. Agenda item 10B is a report on grants and contracts, including those exceeding $1 million. This item does not require any act action. Members, the reports were included on the agenda materials that you received prior to the meeting. Ms. Linda Natal, Director of Contract and Grants Management, is available if you have any questions. Hearing none, we will move on to the next agenda item. Agenda item 10C is consideration of adopting a resolution authorizing the issuance of State of Texas college student loan bonds in one or more series, and delegation of the authority for administration and approval of these activities necessary to complete the sale of the private activity bonds. Mr. Ken Martin, Assistant Commissioner for Financial Services and Chief Financial Officer, will present this item and be available for questions. Richard Donahue, partner with McCall, Parkhurst, and Horton, will also be available to answer any questions. Mr. Martin. 
Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, board members. Yesterday you heard me discuss a little bit about the student loan program, which has been in existence for a little over 50 years. It started in 1966 with the first uh, bond issue of $10 million, and now we're around $150 million uh, bonds, uh, $50 million in bonds issued on an annual basis. So quite a significant amount of growth with that. These bonds fund the student loans for each academic year. The particular uh, bond resolution that we have before you is to issue, uh, go to the market, sell bonds in July, maybe the end of June, depending on market timing, and the proceeds would fund academic uh, year 2022 and 23. So the resolution basically uh, delegates from the board authority to myself or the commissioner and or the commissioner the authority to act on behalf of the board, all matters necessary to close on these bonds and uh, be able to uh, receive those proceeds. I do have uh, Mr. Donahue here from McCall, Parkhurst, and Horton to answer any questions uh, specific to any legal matters. Uh, other than that, we're here to answer any questions you may have. Uh, so we're, we're delegating to uh, the commissioner or the administration to negotiate the details of the legal documents, et cetera? The, the commissioner, as it states right now, is it has in prior years the commissioner or the chief financial officer. That is correct. Right. So really we can just uh, – he can decide if there's any tweaks to the documents, et cetera. So we don't have to guide that at all. That is, that is correct. Right. And, and I'll let Mr. Donahue speak to that. That's going to be outside my realm. That is absolutely correct. This is the board's official action with respect to the issuance of the bonds. There's no further action required from the board. You're delegating the authority for the final pricing to either the commissioner or the chief financial officer. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? We did discuss this in more detail yesterday. Okay. Do I have a motion then to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance of State of Texas college student loan bonds in one or more series and delegation of the authority for administration and approval of these activities necessary to complete the sale of the private activity bonds? So move. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. And this concludes the Agency Operations Committee report. Thank you, Ms. Schwartz. For those that are watching online, I think, and new members of our board, uh, you know, the committee structure does a lot of work right prior to this board meeting. So those that are watching, you're going, well, some of these things are going by pretty fast. But whether the degree proposals, which sometimes take years, with an S at the end of the years, and then uh, a lot of due diligence goes in by the staff and, and the board gets involved in some cases, but also these financial issues. Uh, you know, Mr. Martin does a great job in providing information to the board and the board leadership uh, in advance. Uh, the board leadership meets monthly, and so there's a lot of uh, due diligence that goes into this, just so people that are watching for the first time or the new board members' edification, okay? And, and we've had a, a chance to deep dive more at the committee-level meetings as well. That's right, right, and that's, you know, that's how it all ties in. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, great meeting, everyone, and welcome again to the new board members. Mm -hmm. And at this point... Uh, this concludes the meeting. The time is 2.02 p.m. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion by Mr. Torn. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Wilson. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposition? Hearing none, the motion passes. Thank you all very much. Have a great afternoon.